distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, let me take this singular honor to welcome you to this hybrid town hall meeting on the subject of political economy analysis of electoral reforms in Uganda. Let me also welcome our esteemed uh, virtual audience that is joining us live on Zoom, on YouTube, but also on, on Facebook. I salute you all. We are honored to host you and also to enjoy with you uh, the insightful discussion that we are going to have. This town hall meeting comes at a time when Africa's nascent democracy is being confronted with challenges uh, of, uh, of gigantic nature. We have seen a return to military coups, to, to, to violence where uh, civilian governments have been uh, 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 removed by military uh, um, um, uh, units. We, we, this is something we have seen happening in Guinea, in Senegal. I was reading the news yesterday, and I was told that Sudan yesterday tested, witnessed its uh, uh, um, most violent day uh, when they lost, I think, about around 11 citizens that were trying to push back against the military that removed their unelected government. So this morning we stand here uh, and convene uh, awake to the reality that Uganda's past four elections and a multi-party dispensation, and to be exact, 2006, 2011, 2016 and 2021 recently have all been contested. And when I talk about contestation, let me talk about the elephant in the room. And the elephant is that elections in Uganda continue to suffer from a lack of credibility and integrity. But electoral integrity is not only a challenge for Uganda, it's a challenge for many African countries. And therefore, this morning, as we get together to discuss on this interesting subject, uh, it would be good to, uh, to think about solutions and what we can do, and, and, and also be inspired by, by our brothers in, 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 in Sudan who have stood in unison to push back against a group of people that think they own the monopoly of thinking for the people. Citizen efforts such as the Citizens' Compact on Free and Fair Elections were all intended to make sure that we improve the credibility of our electoral processes. Let me challenge us to renew these efforts. It's against this backdrop, therefore, that ACFIM organized this town hall to provide a structured platform for political parties and organizations election management bodies, <coughs> civil society, uh, citizens and citizens, including the media, to discuss the political and electoral legal reform architecture and its implications for democratic rights and electoral integrity in Uganda. One of Uganda's renowned, scholar, renowned scholars will be here. Uh, to deliver a keynote paper on the subject, political economy analysis of electoral reforms in Uganda. But we shall also be privileged to have other scholars, renowned scholars. I'm happy to note that uh, my uh, lect former lecturer, Dr. Julius Kiza, is in the room. And, uh, and, and so we look forward to quite an interesting discourse. So ACFIM and her partner organizations, including uh, PPI, share a, a historical mission of enhancing democracy as a viable system of governance for not only Uganda, 
but Africa in general. Ladies and gentlemen, let me take the honor of welcoming you to this space and pray that whatever we discuss here should be in a way and manner that it can improve the future of our governance. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Henry Mguzi, the Executive Director, ACFEM. My name is Kanner Mguzi. I'll be moderating this conversation. At the end of this conversation, we only hope that uh, we'll have uh, provided a structured platform for political parties and organizations, election management bodies, civil society, and citizens to be able to freely discuss and, uh, the political and electoral legal reform architecture and its implications for democratic rights and electoral integrity, like uh, Mr. Mguzi put it. At, at this point, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Jude Obitre, the associate of King's College London, to provide a keynote paper on the political economy analysis of political and legal electoral reforms in Uganda. You're welcome. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Once again, uh, my name is Judo Bitre. I happen to be an alumni of uh, Macquarie University Department of Public Education, uh, Political Science and Public Administration. Um, while at Macquarie, I was inspired greatly by the late Professor Kiki Bomera Mujaju and the late Aginera Pinchwa. Uh, my specialty then, after my three years at Macquarie, dovetailed into the world of international relations. And it's from here that I picked up courage to develop my skills around political science. And I ended up at King's College London, where I specialize more in war studies. But when I got back here, I was unemployable. So I decided to work overseas most of my time. And currently, I'm pursuing my PhD at the University of St. Andrews at the School of International Relations under the supervision of Sir Hugh Strachan. So it's a pleasure being with you here. We are talking about serious stuff because politics determines a lot of things. Many times when you sit with lawyers and they open up these statutes, they assume that things are written when you're defining politics. Politics is very dynamic and that's why we look at the political economic analysis or a peer analysis, which is normally how we look at how power is constructed and contested in a given space, taking keen interest in the actors, the dynamics, and how it impacts on how income and wealth is distributed. It's often very ugly, it's not straightforward. So on November 19, 2020, and under the aegis of the International uh, the Inter Regions Council, um, who had gathered in Kampala, and we saw those ugly scenes of those doves not flying, um, Uganda was going through a crossroad of electoral anarchy at the time. And there were a lot of shocking revelations of human rights abuse against political leaders and activists, as well as journalists. We all saw that. We don't have to go into the details. However, the extent and gravity of the reported incidents had deeply distressed the opposition as well as the ruling government in power. And there was that question of uh, what are we doing? Are we getting to elections or it's a fight? Therefore, it was necessary to send out a strong message and seek out a new beginning so to make elections again truly credible in light of uh, the force of service against the powers of political anarchy. Since I myself was a voter at the time, I picked out of interest in what was happening and today, I want to share a bit of contribution towards that. Therefore, after this happened, especially the Interreligious Council meeting and what we saw happening, I compiled some notes, and I've been writing these notes for some time, and I thought I'd contribute something towards society, and today comes when I have to present a piece of paper uh, to this colloquium. My introductory essay is divided into three parts. Uh, in the first part, uh, I aim to present briefly the wider political context of the question, uh, without which we cannot understand deeper if we just jump into what electoral reform or political reform means. I try to show as much as possible that the last elections were quite egregious, and we all know about that, but this is not out of nothing. There's a lot of history tied to that, especially if you go into the post-colonial histories, especially across Africa. In the second part, I aim to point out the effects of the situation in which democratic backsliding and how it manifests itself, not just in the context of Uganda, but across Africa. This is quite critical, 
because from the heavens, as we say, when things are going down, it always goes so bad. Finally, in the third part, I would like to develop some perspectives for a proper response on the part of the wider society and how pro reform agents can spur the transition to democracy. Fighting a hybrid regime as this one is a tough game. I was grappling yesterday with the strategic dimensions of warfare, how political parties that are so innocently structured with very little manpower can take on the juggernaut of this kind of regime. It's a tough business, I can tell you. It's a tough business. And then we can see how we can be able to go through the different mechanisms and ideas on how we can stifle for this backsliding, knowing that democracy can work, the, all, the challenges of us to make it uh, real. So to unpack this discussion, this discussion begins with a background within the political power, within, within the context of the political power is constructed and supported by history from the pre-colonial. For those who don't want history, you have to be a bit, a bit patient, to the contemporary. When we start the war, we talk always about the new wars and the old wars. The old wars built around the Clausewitz, the, the Clausewitzian perspective, and the new wars built by Ran Mel Caldo. Always tells us things that, oh, the old is different from the new, but the more you read, there's always a connection between the two. So what appears new may not necessarily be new, what appears old may not necessarily be new. So in Africa, specifically Uganda, we examine how leaders consolidated power. What incipiently was only intended for managing a populace was now shown for the purpose of selfish control. What at first was only intended for chipping the power seat consequently was widely accepted as a feasible option of holding on to the vestiges of power. Similar effects were achieved by African elites and we've got to be very conscious about this because their excesses then became a common occurrence to the point that it was like a human wishbone being pulled in different directions. Now, human beings, we don't have a wishbone like birds because the birds need it for their flight mechanics. But somehow, when power starts being fought for, we somehow assume that we have a wishbone. I still remember seeing as a child, turmoil, something that I had previously only seen in times of war because I grew up as a refugee child for 11 years. I've seen war. I've lived in the Democratic Republic of Congo as a toddler, and I've seen my parents drift from DRC to Angola even during the time of war if I got back here. I've seen it so ugly, and the prospects of war should never be encouraged in our country. I've also seen things get ugly, where politics is mistaken as a do it all, die for it, and that leads often to ugly authoritarianism. And this is how we come back to the freedoms of the Revolution of 1986. What exactly did we fight for? What did we achieve? What exactly do we mean by achieving? But alas, the expectation of Uganda has collapsed, has collapsed because there's a far greater divide between the world of freedom and the world of fear than there's between the competing factions within a free society. That's why we're here today to talk about reforms with a view to facilitating a better climate for 2026 and the years to come forward. Now, part of this visionome means we have to contend with the fact that democracy has been circulating as a debased currency in the political marketplace because of the ambiguity that surrounds it. The distinguished American political theorist Robert Dahl tried to introduce a new term called polyarchy. In its stead, in the vain hope of gaining a greater measure of conceptual precision. But for better or worse, we are still stuck with democracy. Now allow me a brief excursus at this point in light of the scale of this discussion to go back to the post-colonial period that I talked about. Why the post-colonial period? And I'll try to be as kind enough to those who do not want to listen to a lot of this stuff. Now those who seek to, earth, those who seek to move earth, as Archimedes has told us, must always first have a place to stand on. And this is a key message to our pro reform agents. Before you agitate for power, you must always have where to stand. Sometimes we agitate without knowing where to stand, and that means the earth will swallow us. So history, therefore, provides us with a place to stand, a reference point from where to leverage this discussion. To be sure, leaders who took over the administration of most African states after independence were products of the colonial era. Indeed, with the exception of few countries that fought wars of liberation, political affairs after independence were dominated by inheritance elites. We can go on, but above all, we know that they had their own frailties that are shrouded around the element of greed. And for, for a better part of many years, we shaped our politics to the detriment of our communities. We also have to grapple with weak institutions that came thereafter and ethnic exploitation. Across Africa, many political, economic, and social institutions at the time of independence were not robust enough to withstand the heavy burden of the transition to democracy 
and therefore independence, and that meant that they were learning on the job. On the whole, elite mismanagement of political affairs after independence contributed to the weakening of political structures. To compound this, the generation of leaders that followed the inheritance and elites often made matters worse. Keith Somerville, who taught me at King's College, notes that the process of decolonization had exaggerated the power and standing of some political leaders, vesting them powers of patronage, rent sinking, control of the media, and crucially monopoly over coercive forces. We all know that from Max Weber, that for you to run a country, you must have control and monopoly over power. And also you must have monopoly over violence. This is the paradox that we deal with. On one hand, you want to run a government smoothly, but at the same time, you must have monopoly over violence. You must not forget that. And of course, we also have to talk about the exploitation of ethnicity, and that continues into our present times. I remember seeing the last elections, General Kahindo Tafir reminding his constituents that power could not leave his base because they fought in 1986. How unfortunate. Then we look at electoral manipulation. And this is the key thing that always becomes problematic each time we hold elections. Institutional capacity building had not generally been on the agendas of colonial powers, and most newly independent African states lacked the political structures to manage effective and genuine transfer of power. And I think that's what we are talking about today. We lack the capacity, the willpower to transfer power. They're also hampered by the imposition of constitutional liberal democracy that reflected neither the pre-colonial systems of governance nor in the example of brutal, a brutal historical irony, colonial rule itself. So across Africa, it became the norm that once elected political parties tended to stay in power forever. And that's how we end up having the big men effect. And it's always the men, unfortunately. We don't talk about the big women. We talk about the big men, the warlords who suddenly come into power on the first day they recite democracy, recite the constitution as if they are possessed and the next day they hold the gun and then they tell you, wait a minute, we've got security to take care of. So, electoral manipulation has become such a big challenge and we have to look across Africa for very particular cases where the incumbent has not been misused. Vote rigging and other forms of electoral fraud. It's still often the case that African big men have become exceedingly problematic. Here is an example of one who did stand down if relatively peacefully is Abdai Wade of Senegal, who was defeated in 2012 elections. This makes Senegal one of the handful countries to see uh, electoral transition of power. And of course, you also remember the guy in Guinea, Jame, who conceded, but after some time was changing until the ECOWAS forces pushed him out. So in almost all African countries, the electoral process adopted as being of winner takes it all, rather than the attempt to include differing voices. In many cases, elections are rigged to ensure victory because the consequences of defeat were impossible to contemplate. A phenomenon that expresses itself, for example, the use of violence and intimidation in the conduct of elections. In recent years, exceptionally violent elections have occurred in Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, Nigeria, and of course, Zimbabwe. Even otherwise, what we call well-run elections in South Africa have also been burdensome. And also, if you look at Mali, and if you go to that problem, it comes down from how they have managed themselves around that space. And in Kenya, during the post-election violence, because that country is so divided along ethnic lines, and the story continues on, and then people eventually tie in things with like marginalization, unemployment and unemployment, land rights, and eventually you create the crucible ball that could lead to kinetics of natures that we would not want to have here. And if I, I pause around here a little bit, We've been going through the recent dramatic events of terrorists in this capital city. And what I see is the tone of militarism. Terrorism is political. It's inherently political. And I beg our leaders to pay a lot of attention on those dimensions. It doesn't just occur out of a vacuum. I will repeat it, it's a political dimension and not necessarily about using guns and boots on the ground. We need to learn from the Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan on the mistakes they have made there. We'll come to in the torrents of dissent. We suddenly seem like we cannot live together. Ugandans go to churches. They pray a lot. I call them the holy arms. They always swing them. But they cannot coexist politically. Underpinning corruption of electoral politics 
is our inability to live together, especially among the political elites. Across Africa, national security apparatuses, including the police, the paramilitary, clientage systems, and armed forces have been used to silence known opponents of the government. Very often, the judicial system itself has had no real independence from the government. It's not a Ugandan thing. Even the United States, you've seen how it's important for one to appoint a Supreme Court judge and how you can play that along the way. So we need to be very careful about accepting dissent because it kills early activism. And we see that in the 1970s, President Yorim Seven himself becoming an activist. And eventually, he captures power in 1986 after going through a very gruesome guerrilla warfare. In Zimbabwe, under Robert Mugabe, it was also similar. M Mugabe began like a nice guy, then eventually he, become, he becomes a problem to the Zimbabweans. And we've seen how he has repressed power in that country. And Munangangwa, who prides himself using the Lacoste brand, has become the true meaning of a crocodile. Mismanagement and corruption is something that we cannot run away from because that later on will empower us. Corruption, mismanagement of natural resources, continues to be a problem because these resources are used right from the colonial times to build the cash that is needed to control society. Corruption demonstrates the weakness of political structures, and corruption does not have any positive outcomes. I remember one time someone was telling us that corruption is good because people steal money and keep it domestically. And therefore we have these new buildings and all these kind of malls. We talked about kleptocracy during the times of the colonial period. We all remember about Mobutu Sasisako, Jean Claude Bokassa, and the likes of Sania Bacha. Mismanagement corruption does weaken democracy and eventually empties our progress towards that. So we need to assess government in the post colonial period. After independence, many African states set aside pretensions of liberal democracy and opted instead for a form of highly centralized government and personal rule. And that is what is happening today. It just didn't occur here. It's been the trend since independence that most of them opted to go for that direction. African socialists such as Julius Nyerere of Tanzania and Kwame Nkrumah, the first prime minister of Ghana, argued that one-party systems were better reflected, Af better reflected African realities than a liberal democracy in which they defended one-party rule. For those who read political science in consciousism, philosophy, and the Jewish Constitution 1970, Kwame Nkrumah writes, a people's parliamentary democracy with one party system is better able to express and satisfy the common aspirations of a nation as a whole than a multi-party parliamentary system, which is in fact only a ruse for perpetuating and covering up the inherent struggle between the haves and have-nots. Ghana has since moved on from that direction. Tanzania is still stuck in that direction. On one hand, it appears like an election, but on one hand, it's an exercise done in a boardroom somewhere and who will become the next president. Robert Rothbach, writing in 2003, offers an alternative view, drawing examples of good leaders, and this is something that will keep coming up as we to move towards reforms. Sometimes we want to have reforms, but what kind of leaders do we project to the public? And Rothbach shows us that Africa is not predestined to either one-party states or bad governance. Instead, it is Africa's leaders who have determined its course. And as a reporter, if you read Rothbard, uh, uh, Wilson uh, Tete's article on African leadership, he does foreground that Africa has a challenge of leadership. I bring this up bec today because the struggle for peace and security is not linked to promoting democracy all the time. The road to peace is seen as a paved one with good intentions, goodwill, and faith in the brotherhood of a nation. But security is believed to be a function of strong leaders, as you already said, as always told us, and powerful armies. All of these, of course, can help advance peace and security. But detached from the idea of free society, they can just as easily be placed at the service of evil. Now, around what idea might politics, society, and all of you in this room revolve? How do you change? How can agitation, and my discussions will be talking about this, stop the democratic backsliding? A very interesting term used but rarely analyzed is citizenship, a concept that goes back to the city-states of Greek and Rome. It's more than just a political idea, a concept. As Aristotle also said, man is a political animal. This is a very common phrase for students of political science. But we are only human, he thought, as long as we are active participants in our political communities. In a democracy, people are not just consumers, 
workers, business owners, servers or investors, we are citizens. This is the tie that binds people together in a shared endeavor, and it's time that Uganda start looking at their citizenship seriously. David Halkan emphasizes how small changes can make a big difference inside the nudge unit. You need to nudge. We need to keep nudging. Within the nudge unit, we also have the wise words and counsel of Peter John and Graham Smith, together with Jerry Stoker, who prefer two contrasting approaches governments use to engage the citizen to promote better public policy outcomes, nudging citizens using the insights of behavior economists. And that is a key message that goes out to the proponents of deliberative democracy. You have to keep nudging. Second, the most important reason for emphasizing here today is about what Aristotle outlined almost two and a half million years ago. The necessary condition for stability for any constitutional democracy and this stability is a thriving middle class. This has been a very contentious topic overall, worldwide. We've been talking about the middle class and somebody thinks it's a joke. For us to move to the level where we want to be, we need to talk about the middle class being a key engine and lever of that. In its absence, the state risks turning into a plutocracy, a demagogy, and a tyranny. With the following out of the middle class, even established Western democracies are now in danger. I invite you to read the book of Eric Lonergan and Mark Blythe in Angronomics, which is, gives a very great insight about how the middle class is important. Third is the averment of Asemoglu, who talks about the different social groups within our society that prefer different political institutions because of the way they allocate political power and resources to themselves. And he goes on, on and on, talking about democratizing and how elites credibly transfer power to themselves but indirectly. So in one way, in order to be strong, you have to be weak. Governments promote parliamentary democracy and this so-called represent democracy, not because they want it. It's about sharing power. In order to be strong, you create a parliament that is weak to pass the laws that sustain in power. This is how it's done world over. So we get excited with elections sometimes, but those in charge of power are only weakening themselves to be strong. How did you get here? How can systematic and explicit progress be realized? What kind of concrete actions can be taken to improve our fortunes, our collective fortunes? First and most important, we need to append state-led debilitation and elimination of political institutions that sustain the existing democracy. Our colleague who is a lawyer will be talking about this. Since the political institutions sustain democracy, they also include a myriad of other institutions that play within that space. This particular thing also embraces multiple processes since the state actors who might initiate backsliding are themselves diverse, ranging from monarchs to presidents to military men. We see that in Sudan. FINA captures the key features in the political role of the military, for example. And the military is a very big problem in Africa, but also in other parts of the world. Where civilian associations and parties are strong and numerous, where the procedures for the transfer of power are orderly, and where the location of supreme authority is not seriously challenged, seriously challenged, the political ambit of the military will be circumscribed. Where the parties or trade unions are feeble and few, where the procedure for transfer of power is regular or even non-existent, there the military, its political scope will be very, very, very wide. And this is what defines Uganda. The scope of the military is very wide because the other players within that space are feeble, they are poorly organized, and don't have the willpower to take them on, on a game of attrition that they have mastered over the years. Second is to play close attention to the weaponization of politics. A close historical look at the virtues of backsliding during the classical open-ended coups that he talked about. And we're going to look at things like the promissory coups, the executive coups of the past in Peru, for example, in Armenia, and also in Belarus in 1995 under Alexander Lukashenko, and in Zambia in 1996 when Chiluba turned into a pit bull, and in Haiti under Rene Prival. These were all what you'd call executive coups. And then the coups have transitioned to executive aggrandizement, where now finally it leads to blunt at election day vote fraud. I'm told in Uganda you don't have to plan just to campaign. You also have to campaign for who is the best thug out there, who is the best border border rider, who can cause anarchy, and that determines the election day. So aggrandizement has moved forward to what you'd call blatant electoral fraud, 
and that has defined the politics of the electoral systems and how we treat it going forward and how we constitute it in our own right. For example, what are the reasons behind the initial adoption of electoral systems? And who supports it? And who opposes it? Who benefits from it? Who loses out? This highlights issues relevant to normative debates about which electoral systems work well and which don't. Which ones operate uncontentiously and which ones focus on division? And the third is taking on the danger of strategic election manipulation. This is the biggest problem that we face because our elections look very good, but at the end of it all, they are shrouded by executive aggrandizement, strategic manipulation, denotes a range of actions aimed at tilting the electoral playing field in favor of incumbents. These include hampering media houses, media access, using government funds for incumbents, electoral financing, access to information, keeping opposition parties off the ballot, inhibiting voter registration, packing the electoral commission with cutters, changing electoral rules to favor the incumbents, harassing opponents, and the list goes on and on. Now the sad bit about it, as Emily Bolio and Susan Haidt argue, is that election manipulation is so strategic in that international and often domestic observers mm -hmm are less likely to catch or even criticize it. And that's why we have all these observers coming here to sunbathe and enjoy our scenery. And at the end of it all, sit in a hotel room, in a couch, and then write these reports that are often a repetition of the last election they could have attended in either Mauritania or somewhere in Haiti. It is an insult. So how do we mitigate the backsliding? We need to shift the pace. In military science or in war studies, they tell you that when you have a problem in a battlefield, you must take initiative. If you don't take initiative, your opponent takes it up. You need to take the initiative and step up your pace for those who are in the civil service. The decline of coups means that the democratization today it tends to be incremental rather than sudden. Dramatic mishaps will probably still occur, but troubled democracies are now more likely to erode rather than to shatter. Guillermo O'Donnell had submits that research, for example, on hybrid regimes like the one we deal with has been a step forward, but we need to know more about how they slide backward into hybridity and how they consolidate power like a hydra. Furthermore, incremental forms of backsliding create acute political consequences and challenges for us as well. Domestic alterations in electoral laws, district boundaries, electoral commissions, voter registration, procedures may seem too arcane but they are most of the time deliberate. Elections don't start just because they have been announced. Those who are preparing for 2026 needed to have started working now. At a more general level, the slow slide, slow slides towards authoritarianism often lacks both the bright spark that ignites an effective call for action and the opposition and the movement leaders who can voice that clarion call. Executive aggrandizement takes place precisely where the majority that supports exists. Strategic electoral manipulation takes place where the incumbents already deem themselves capable of either securing or reinforcing majority support. And this is often bought outrightly, and that's why opposition leaders who also succeed in mobilizing people always do so little. Their success is also heavily dependent on foreign allies. That even when you galvanize, you tend to be dependent on foreign allies. I remember the when the U.S. naval vessels docked in Mombasa, when all of a sudden everyone was excited, they are coming, a Mary. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Political participation and political culture, Gabriel Almond, in the prehistory of civic culture, study reminds us about the established democracies and also looks at the growing number of citizens and questions the effectiveness of their public institutions at the very moment when liberal democracy has swept the battlefield both ideologically and geopolitically. In America, at least, there's a reason to suspect that this democratic disarray may be linked to a broad and continued erosion of civic engagement that began a century ago. Civic disengagement. High on Uganda's agenda should be the question of how to reverse these adverse trends in social connectedness, thus restoring civic engagement and civic trust, as Putman urges. This brings back the equilibrium where it's supposed to be, for those who ride horses, if you don't canter on a horse, it's going to throw you off. You need to be where you're supposed to be in terms of your civic engagement and social connectedness. And this public discussion is very important. Representation. Let us ponder what place 
does representation have in modern political systems? How far should representation listen to electors when making decisions? How far should representatives be held to account for their actions at the ballot box? And the questions go on and on. Quickly, we must be very cognizant of the fact that representation is our right as citizens, but in most cases it appears it is a favor. I would like to borrow Jenny Mansbridge, uh, the Adams Professor of Political Leadership and Democratic Advisor at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. The traditional model of representation focuses on the idea that during campaigns, representatives make promises to constituents which they then keep or fail to keep. Jenny calls this promissory representation. I think Ugandans are dealing with promissory representation, not actual representation. In addition, empirical work in the last 20 years has identified the last three other forms of representation, which is anticipatory, gyroscopic, and surrogate. And you can go and read this. This paper will be available. What is anticipatory? Ugandans need to anticipate their leaders. We also must cease to be used and therefore play around the theme of surrogate representation. Surrogate representation occurs when legislators represent constituents outside their own districts. These are all legitimate forms of representation. None, however, meets the criteria for democratic accountability devolved for promissory representation. This is forgotten by Hannah Fenichel as well, when she asserts that the concept of representation is puzzling not because it lacks a central definition, but because that definition implies a paradox, being present, but yet not present. And it's too general to help reconcile the world around this, and it's often thoughtlessly equated, and the two ideas have different or even conflicting origins. We know that democracy came from the Greeks, but was one through struggle from the below. Greek democracy was participatory and bore no relationship to representation. Representation dates at least as a political concept and practice from the late medieval period, which was imposed as a duty by the monarch. Only in English civil war, and the 18th century thereafterwards, democratic traditions did the two concepts become linked. Electoral systems, and this is something that I quickly touch on because my colleague will talk about it. This has been a contentious topic. And as far as Uganda is concerned, I pose the question that civil society should explore. What are the advantages of majoritarian electoral systems? What are the advantages of a proportional electoral system? What is electoral engineering and why does it matter? Why do countries change their electoral systems? How often do we change theirs? Our English part in Patterns for Democracy helps us deal with some of these issues in chapters one or four of the seminar book. And those who look into that space, please pay attention. He talks about the majoritarian or Westminster democracy. I'm not going to that. But we know that consensus democracies differ along two dimensions. And the five elements of that have also been detailed there. He talks about kinder and gentler democracy being better because it leads to welfare states. It takes care of the environment. They imprison fewer people. These all seem to be very idealist ideas, but it's something good to look at in terms of representation. But also there's a problem with Arendt because she assumes economic disparity can be used as a proxy for political equality. That's not true. And those who read this paper will go into that argument and how we can go on to break the carapace of what I would call challenged, uh, 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 challenge, challenge, challenges that we face in our democratization in Africa. And these challenges need to be first for them. Now, I'll give you a very beautiful story, okay, about a gentleman called Andre Amarik, and I was reading his story, how encouraging it was. In 1969, he was a dissident, and he wrote a book with the Soviet Union, survived until 1984, in which he predicted the collapse of the USA, yet scholars and leaders in the Western sphere were blind to what was happening then in Soviet Union. Imagine that kind of disconnect. This gentleman is thinking about the collapse of the Soviet Union, but the Western world never thought that it'd go down under. So Amarik explains that any state forced to devote so much of its energies to physically and psychologically control millions of its citizens, as it is done here today, and countries like Russia, where two-thirds of their budget is on intelligence and security, could not survive indefinitely. The unforgettable image he left the reader with was that of a soldier who must always point a gun at his enemy. His arms begin to tire until the weight becomes unbearable. Exhausted, foolish, tired, he lowers his gun and the prisoner escapes. You can't control society for as long as you can. Civil society has a role to play in terms of keeping the pressure and momentum. 
the gun that is pointed to you will eventually become heavy. The finances that are spent on intelligence can eventually run out. And we know how the economies are becoming stressed, especially during this period of time, when it's not just COVID, but the global shortage of chips, shortage of shipping containers, skyrocketing inflation has put a strain on many governments. Party systems, but I'll begin with political parties because this is key. I don't know how many are here. We need to examine the role of political parties. We also need to look at oligarchy that deals within the political parties. So on one hand, political parties seem to project that they are better outside, but within the political parties, they are fighting among themselves. I was seeing a cartoon by Dr. Spire, St. Tongo, of the president seated with his wife, and Kiza Besig and Bobby Weiner carrying each other. None of them had a, a trouser. So how do you contest for power when within your own parties or within your dynamics you are fighting? Russell Dalton and Martin Wattenberg give us an interesting perspective that makes sense in Uganda's context by documenting the broad scale erosion of the public's partisan identities in virtually all advanced industrial democracies. Additionally, Russell and Martin demonstrate how political parties have adapted to partisan disalignment and strengthen their internal and organization structures. And he goes on to talk about things like centripetal and centrifugal, for centrifugal forces within the parties. For those who are political parties, pay attention to your centripetal and your centrifugal. In the battlefield, these are important factors when you confront an enemy, especially in a terrain that is not yours. And again, I'll reflect back to what is happening here in Uganda with an urban terrorist who may not necessarily be wise, but because he can operate in an urban environment that is quite unfamiliar for security challenges in terms of containing. Party systems, to do justice to this important lever, I briefly examine Satoshi's approach of party systems. In addition, I'll shed light on party systems and how they're centralized, uh, sorry, and characterized. We talked about the centripetal. This is traditionally associated with the need to capture the median voter in a two-tiered system. And this is something that is always defeating the parties, capturing that soft voice, the neutral population. In a battle, when you are dealing with insurgency, if you don't have control of the neutral population, you cannot win that war. Parties need to pay attention to that medium. Then we talk about the centrifugal, which is associated with the pivotal center, where parties that are so strong control the electoral system. This is where the NRM is very strong, because they are able to control both the centripetal and the centrifugal forces within their structure. Finally, why civil society should count the number of parties and how that number affects policies. Are we better off having few parties? Are we better off having many parties? In countries where military regimes control, you tend to have a plethora of parties. At one time in Zaire, there were almost 300 parties. And this was a controversy because at independence, they only had two graduates. But somehow they tend to have a lot of parties over the years. Are they developed suddenly? Why are parties becoming a challenge? To effectively analyze party systems, I draw your attention to Herbert Kisha's book on the Oxford Handbook of Political Science, which conceptualizes party systems as being separate from parties. Party systems are separate from political parties. The subject of political party systems may be too complex and heterogeneous to deserve coherent treatment in key political science handbooks, but for this discussion, I submit that the proliferation of political party typologies leads to a confusion and profusion at the same time. Therefore, the substantive alignments of interests and competitiveness of party systems representing such interests are critical variables in how power is shaped and how a regime survives. I also argue that in the study of the dimensionality of party competition, more attention needs to be paid to the distinction between social, political, and competitive partisan divides, which the pluriform agents should take care of. In conclusion, and I can see some of you are getting tired, my review of the political and legal reform context has been highly selective, driven by my personal research interest in the area and therefore to stretch certain agenda points for future research. Therefore, I believe more emphasis by the civil society, pro reform agents, and also those in the regime has to be placed on the comparative study of the varieties of mechanisms that may govern the relationship between principles and agents. The principal agent problem needs to be looked into there. I also believe that in the study of dimensionality, of party competition, more attention needs to be paid to the distinction between social, political, and competitive person divides. And third about, about it, third and intimately linked to the above is the previous point, the competitiveness of party systems. The competitiveness of party systems deserves greater conceptualization 
and more intense scrutiny. Conversely, I submit also that too much significance has been attached to certain relativity, and that is always easily managed at the macro parties of party systems, such as party system fragmentation and volatility. My treatment of party systems has ignored, obviously, certain discussions, but for this particular discourse, I want to keep reminding you of the consequences of party competition for a variety of political and economic processes. Among them, I would, therefore, count the formation of legislative and executive majorities, the exacting process of political formation and implementation. At the same time, as I conclude, we need to be conscious of a more sophisticated concentration of party systems, particularly of mechanisms of democratic accountability. And this has been elusive over the years, that as we seek reforms, those seeking reform are not accountable. You cannot preach water and you drink wine. So accountability must be able to be reflected in both in the opposition parties and also within the government, particularly in terms of how we transform our society towards the same values that we want them to go to. Finally, we need to improve the causal efficiency of explanation that employ party system attributes to predict political and economic developments, and therefore what I would call the political regime trajectories. For those who want to contest for power, you need to understand that securing power is not a game of just getting it on a silver platter. You need to put in the hard work, you need to put in a double shift, especially for a government that in power that has all the levers, all the boxes that they tick at their own pace, and therefore keep you off the competitive landscape. I once again thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present this paper. And I look forward to discussing with you. This paper will be available to my principals shortly after here. And then you'll be able to internalize it. Of course, I ran through most of it. It was a composure of 30 pages. But I tried as much as possible to compress within that time slot. I once again thank you so much. And may God bless you, wishing you good deliberations as I invite my discussants to come in and weigh in on this particular topic. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for Joe DeBitsche. Many thanks for that powerful presentation. Uh, Jude does remind us to have a place to stand, and uh, that is at least the bare minimum. Even failure to do that, there are even consequences for that. And uh, he did define those consequences, like sliding back in democracy. So to kickstart this panel discussion, um, uh, I will invite all of you to actually go and have your tea. You know, we'll do a working tea so that we don't lose the audience online. So to kickstart this conversation on uh, the panel discussion to discuss the powerful vested interests in Uganda uh, that are at the, en at the entrance of serious political and electoral legal reforms, but even in this difficult climate. Allow me invite Sara Bidete, the Executive Director for Center for Constitutional Governance. And also allow me invite Associate Professor Julius Chiza political economy and uh, development at the Department of uh, Political Science and Public Administration, Macquarie University. <laughs> Both of you are welcome. Will you take your seats? Again, I'll remind you that uh, feel free to reach out at the back and get your tea served. Well, at least one thing that we cannot contest is that uh, one thing we cannot contest is the contest is the absence of agitation. The agitation does exist, but the question is, how can agitation for reform continue and succeed? Over to you, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I hear our master of ceremonies and the congratulations upon your wedding? Thank you. Our hosts 
ACFIM and the PPI and the, our guest speaker, Jude. Thank you very much. And uh, I will try to respond to the issues you were raising, but using our civil society language, because this being a town hall, I think we should try as much as possible to simplify. And I will go straight to what we experienced in the just concluded elections. The 2021 elections were the sixth election under, under our 1995 constitution, but also a fourth multi-party election in this country. And it came at the backdrop of COVID, COVID-19 guidelines closed the space for most of the, of the actors. We had reforms that were, you know, were part of the long process of the Supreme Court petition of John Patrick Amamambavazi versus Yoel Seven in 2016, where the Supreme Court made eight recommendations and also in a new approach and a departure from their previous conduct, they directed the Attorney General to implement those recommendations and also gave a time frame of two years for the enactment of the reforms that the court had agreed with out of the AMCAS application by Makere University. So that was one you know, milestone and, and a new aspect of our constitutional reform journey as a country. The eight directives given to Attorney General to enact as reforms, six of them were fully enacted in the electoral, the revised the electoral laws that were ascended to in February 2020. The pending issues where one, the reforms should have been passed in the first two years, but they were passed in one year. They were debated a few months to elections, passed, and even citizens did not know, and they were not implemented in the last elections, having been ascended to in February. So that was the first violation. The second violation that was intentional the directive to make sure there is clear punishment of public servants that engage in partisan conduct, including partisan campaigns and perpetrating violence, was completely ignored by the Attorney General and Parliament. There was also a reform on enacting laws to enable the use of technology in our elections. Yes, the laws were enacted, but there were no guidelines on how technology should be used in our elections. And there was vagueness of what is expected of a voter, what, how they should identify themselves amidst all the challenges and lack of civic or voter education in the last campaign. So that is the, the brief journey where we are on, on reforms. But among the key challenges we have to highlight in regards to elections in Uganda is high militarization of our elections I think the military this time exceeded all our expectations to the extent that they even engaged in kidnaps, extrajudicial killings. People are still missing according to the parliamentary record. Some Ugandans are still missing. People that were arrested for supporting NUP presidential candidate Robert Chagrani and tried in court martial the trial of civilians in Kotomasho. Just before we occupied this podium and before the start of the meeting, we were debating how this regime has been playing around with terrorism and branding civil society and opposition supporters terrorists. And as we sit here today, real terrorism is before us and the regime is just gambling with how to address it. So these are some of the challenges that we face during elections. The second challenge that we face, of course, a part of the militarism, we know what happened with the supporters of people power, the enactment of, of, of laws that are still, the, the, 
the Gazette being challenged in high court today about wearing of, of, of the berets and the extension and extent of which the military really went to criminalize and curtail the work and supporters of people power in the last elections. We have a challenge of commercialization of politics. We do not have yet laws to limit campaign spending, to ensure there is accountability and transparency in campaign financing. And as I mentioned today, the challenge of global, regional, and internal terrorism is linked to financing. But this country has abused financing laws and using financing to target civic and political actors that do not support the status quo. We need to look at the conduct and, and the way we treat international observers. In the last elections, European Union stated that they would not apply to observe the just concluded elections because all their previous reports and recommendations were ignored. They did send two high-level political teams from Brussels to discuss with the establishment on the recommendations of the EU International Observers Report, and there was no commitment. So that was the basis of them denouncing the exercise of observing the last elections. The US, which tried to apply, 75% of their observers were not accredited, and they did announce that the small mission that was accredited was not sufficient to effectively observe elections and come up with an and a conclusive report. The domestic observers that applied above 800 civil society organizations, only about 30 were accredited. And out of those 30, only seven organizations were known to us as actors in civil society. The other actors, we did not know them. And even those that were accredited, they were arrested on polling day for observing elections. Some of them are still reporting to police today for observing elections for which they were accredited. The other key challenge, drawing from the last elections, is the above one million young voters that, would, that were excluded because of the timelines for voter registration by electoral commission. People that were 18, at the time of voting, we still have a law which provides that for you to qualify to be a registered voter, you must be 18 at the time of registration. So the law excludes people that should be eligible to vote at the time of elections by limiting the, the, the registration one year back before the time of voting. So people who were 17, that would automatically be 18 were excluded by electoral commission roadmap. And in that exclusion, we lost 1.3 eligible voters in the last elections. There was a decision on voting by Ugandans in diaspora and people in gazetted or detention centers where high court directed that the electoral commission should work to ensure that these el eligible voters are enabled to vote. Electoral Commission was unable to. They, was, they, they reached a decision and promised that they will vote in the next elections. But as we talk now, there are no efforts to work on integrating Ugandans in diaspora as well as those in detention centers to ensure that they are eligible to vote through the national ID registration process. We have now, since 2016, a permanent challenge of internet switch off. The switching off of internet may ensures that there is no pro coordination and communication between the different actors engaged in elections, including polling agents, election observers, media, and that curtails the transparency element in the management of our elections, and it's intentional. We have closing civic space. As we sit here today, 54 civil society organizations are closed. We have consistent administrative harassment of civic actors in this country. 
We have stifling of political party activities and the controlled media. So when you remove these three aspects of civic actors, free political activities, controlled media, what kind of elections are we having? And we worse than Sudanese who are on the streets today. So how can we ensure that the, the agitation for electoral reforms succeeds? We have to raise the political cost. We have to raise the political cost on the part of members of parliament. As we talk today, NRM has the numerical strength in parliament beyond the required two-thirds majority. They can pass any law if we do not raise the political cost on them. We attempted raising the political cost in line with age limit as civic actors removal. I think we are 80% successful. The people who agitated and promoted the removal of age limit in the country were punished by voters. That confirms that that's a proven method to use for any reforms you want in this country. So the question is how do we raise the political cost on the part of MPs who have the duty and mandate to amend and enact laws in this country. We have to take these debates out of air-conditioned hotel rooms. We need to take this debate to the streets. We need to take this debate to the grassroots. We need to take this debate to the diaspora so that Ugandans get the critical mass in agitation for reforms. Kiria an equivocal voice of Ugandans. If we don't do that, we are wasting time. We know who has the numbers. And we are not going to appeal for their mercy. We need to raise a risk to them and their being in political space in this country. The other category we need to mobilize in raising the political cost are the international partners of the Republic of Uganda. There is the branding of some of us being called foreign agents because we work with the partners of the Republic of Uganda that work with the government of Uganda. We have rejected that branding, we have rejected that name calling, and we must call out these partners because they are accountable to their citizens whose money they spend in this country. I thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, maybe before I, I just move on to uh, Prof. Y you talk about raising the political cost. What can be done differently? I believe um, in, in, in your efforts as a civil society, you have tried to actually do um, uh, raise the political cost and try to make Ugandans understand what is at stake. But what can be done differently this time around? Well, the citizens are not mobilized. If we talk about what we are discussing in this hall, I'm sure all of you will agree with me that it is still an elitist, argu elitist argument, and we are speaking to ourselves. So how do we change from speaking to ourselves? Can I, if I come to NBS and I'm talking to you, it is still an elitist, elitist argument. As much as NBS can reach out to mass people, but it's an elitist argument. How do we break it down and take it to the common man to under, understand so that we cannot speak the same language? So we need to simplify this debate. We need to connect it to the cost of living of the people. As we discussed today, there is high cost of food prices. There is high cost of fuel. I'm sure most of you are already paying the price. Whether you drive or use public transport, the prices have gone up. So we need to connect the dots for the common man to understand the disadvantages and the impact of bad governance on their day-to-day -day lives. Thank you. Sarah has uh, set the pace for the conversation. And uh, maybe just to understand the, uh, and apply more context, what nature of reforms are likely going to sail through? You know, how can we just go uh, beyond court pronouncements and, and you know, what we see? M more, more like uh, implementation strategies, what nature of reforms are actually likely going to sell through? 
Thank you, Kanare. Thank you, the keynote speaker, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julius Kiza. As a teacher, I am obliged to speak simple language. So I will address the question using very simple language. What kinds of reforms are likely to succeed? That's the question. I invite you to appreciate that reform is of two major varieties, not one. We have reforms that are procedural and reforms that are substantive. Procedural reforms are those that take place at the periphery. They leave the system intact. They maintain the status quo. The power asymmetries, the exploitative relationships, the structures of the state all remain intact, unchanged. And you make only cosmetic reforms, as in the case of the decision to go multi-party in 2005, shifting from the one-party democracy, which was defined by some as a one-party dictatorship, so shifting from that NRM dispensation to a new arrangement which accepted multi-party reform. That reform was procedural because the orientation of the NRM never changed. The NRM agreed procedurally to adopt multi-party, but maintained the idea that the ruling party was a dominant party, and the ruling team were elites with a mission, and the mission was empire building, using public resources predominantly. So, so in other words, the reforms were not substantive. They were cosmetic. The second variety of reforms are those we call structural reforms, Th those that change the status quo, those that create a new political dispensation. I think when we discuss reform here, it's important for us to appreciate what kinds of reform we want to push for at a conceptual level. If we fail conceptually, then we are going to think we are pushing for reform when we are not. The second conceptual issue is that we need to appreciate that reforms may come from within the ruling elites or from outside. The ruling elites can decide that they are making a certain amendment. And sometimes the reforms in parliament are sponsored by the team in power. But sometimes those reforms come from members of the opposition outside the ruling team. So regardless of the source of the reform, we need to appreciate whether the reforms we are pushing for are procedural, they are cosmetic, or whether they are actually dramatic reforms. What kinds of reforms are likely to succeed? I have no hesitation to state that the likelihood of reform success is high if the reform comes from the, within the ruling team. Now, what does that mean? That most of the reforms that have a lease of life are sponsored by actors within the system. That has two implications. The fact is that we have to organize to ensure that reforms that take place do not entrench authoritarian rule. They do not entrench the rule by decree. They do not entrench the rule by a minority to the detriment of the majority of our citizens. And that is possible if we reform our approach to the people in power. Not everyone in power is your enemy. There are within the ruling team, people you can work with. Some of the people in the team are just addressing the bread and butter issues of the day. They are not committed to what the regime is doing. Therefore, it is your duty and my duty to say within that team, who are the progressive forces that we can work with to push a reform agenda? And that way, if, if you organize ideas as a critical voice and give them to some members, in the ruling team, and they appear to be the ones presenting the reforms, they have a lease of life. I'll give you a practical example. I've, I made noise for many years about industrial policy in this country, pushing for industrial policy and going nowhere and being labeled, keeping a misery and so on. But then I changed tactics. I said, let me now work with an institution which has the ears of the government. I will not mention the institution for diplomatic reasons. So I conduct research and we do policy conversations, but not with my voice at the forefront, but with evidence presented by me to these colleagues 
who are also high brains, and they present the ideas to the elites in power as the institutional ideas of this space. The ideas have been taken. One of the ideas that I, I cherish, that the government has adopted, is industrial policy. I am passionate about that. And, and this is not about political reform or electoral reform. It's about industrial policy. And I'm giving it because it's a key example. The second I would give is the push for cooperatives. So, so we need to change strategy, especially where the other team is not receptive to your ideas. Once they perceive them to be aggressive, hostile, we need to, to change strategy and ally with forces within. After all, what do we want? It's a better future for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, our country, our region. So reforms have a high chance of succeeding if they originate from the ruling team. But they don't have to be the authors. You can be co-authors of these reforms with those in power. Second, reforms have a high likelihood of success if you push them with determination. Make no mistake, democracy is a process, not an event. There's no way you're going to think you're going to reform the system in one week, in two weeks, in one year, in two years. It has to be with determination. When I was a student of geography, I learned many years ago that actually in geography, there is a process called weathering, which is the wearing away of rock. And our geography teacher in St. Henry's College of was very good. He said, with time, even the hardest rock will wear away and become dust. So with time, even the most repressive dictators will be tamed. So make no mistake, you have to be determined and we have to work with determination. Number three, reforms have a higher chance of success if they are based on a realistic assessment of the challenges that confront us. The challenges that confront us enable us to define who our allies are and who our potential opponents are. If you are addressing a challenge that has no roots with the masses of the people, you are likely to fail. But if you address a challenge and connect it to the needs of the majority of the citizens, then that means your chances of success improve. I'll give an example. Many NGOs talk very nice language, very good things, but very disconnected to the practical realities of the average, the average day, average person, the Mwanainchi. Many human rights groups went, addressed the rights of the Batua people. These are our fellow citizens living in southwestern Uganda. Now, the Batua, we are being told that you know you need rights, you know you need representation. He said, we, do we eat human rights? This is the question many people you want to work with will ask you. You civil society people, you look rich, you talk rich, you drive expensively, just like the elites in power. They don't see a difference between you and the people in power. So when you're talking the language of human rights, to what degree are you connecting with the material interests of the people you profess to represent? Do we eat human rights? You're going to mobilize the youth. If I must mobilize the youth, I must speak to their interests. Their interests are education. Their interests are skilling in 21st century capabilities, artificial intelligence, robotics engineering, human science, and the idea of security. The youth are interested in representation of the gender agenda. You're saying the women, the time gone are the times when the woman is condemned to the kitchen, the garden, the bedroom. The woman needs equal representation. Are we speaking to that? Are we speaking to the needs of the majority of our people, the workers, the jobless, who are struggling to get the everyday? So reform will likely succeed if it connects with the interest of the majority because that gives it a broad social base, a broad base for supporting your struggle. In Swahili, we say that the struggle for political liberation is unlikely to succeed unless we address the economic fundamentals confronting our people. So, so simply put, uhuru bila nguvu ya kiuchumi ni hewa kabisa. So speak the language of independence, of uhuru, 
if you don't address the economic empowerment of the people you profess to represent, then your struggles are likely to succeed. I want to quickly add that there is a distinction between noise and voice. A lot of times we make noise. And noise is noise if our views are uncoordinated, unrealistic, unfunded. It becomes voice if we coordinate our voices, we coordinate our messages, we speak with those we must work with, with a voice that cannot be ignored by duty bearers. I want to give an example of the last few elections. The opposition parties and many elites, some of them were represented here, said our problem politically is a presidential monarch who came to office promising that he was a temporary leader going to work for less than four years. Now he has become perennial. So this presidential monarch is our problem. Now you ask political parties, different opposition parties, that was the message. Their number one political objective was to change the office bearer. Now you ask that question. If you want to change somebody who has incumbency advantages, do you confront this person with the seven plus disunited political parties? It's like they lost the war even before the battle started. You are confronting a powerful voice, but you are disunited. And then when the election results are announced, you say, the elections were rigged. Did you expect to win? That, that is, and I'm raising this question, not as a citizen, but as a political scientist. Did you expect to win? when you are disorganized from day one? Do you improve your chances when you learn from Kenya and unite your position voice and confront the sitting party so that even the citizens will see a united alternative? The second issue related to that is, are you advancing agendas that are seen by the voters as being different from the incumbent? Or are you like wrong argued in the case of Kenya, looking for your chance to eat. So these are things we must address and address them holistically. I want to end with two comments because this is supposed to be a conversation. General Salim Saleh urges us that the future belongs to the organized. Now this is a general in the army, the ruling party, and the top political elite. He is actually a gamekeeper for many opportunities. How many of us have made an effort to seek audience with this gentleman? He's a gatekeeper. He's a power broker. Don't you think we can package our messages in a manner that gives us a lease of life by speaking to this strong power broker? The future belongs to the organized. If you are disorganized, then we are in trouble. Finally, I want to end with something where we apparently underinvest. And I want to emphasize the point that we need to invest in defining issues cross party, cross ideology, that unite us as citizens. The Citizens Manifesto made an effort. What is it that we want to build? What is the kind of future that we want? What are the things that unite us? irrespective of whether you have your party colors red or yellow or black or blue or whatever. What are the things that unite us as a citizenry? Number one, is it possible that we all want a good education for ourselves and our children? Number two, when it comes to healthcare, does it matter whether you are red or yellow or blue or white? Don't we all want healthcare that works? Number three, jobs. Don't we all want jobs for ourselves and our children? Number four, and I'm sure I should have started with food, the question of food. Now, food is not just a collection of things you put on a plate or in your cup. Food must be of good quality, nutritionally, but it must also be culturally acceptable. So do we have food and nutritional security in our country? Can we have a conversation? as citizens, 
But how about for you urban dwellers? The problem of congestion. Due to narrow roads, the Chinese laugh at us when they come here. You have very few people. In fact, they say there are no people here. Why are you having a jam? I have argued that the jam is immediately associated with the narrow roads. But the narrow roads are in themselves a symptom of a deeper crisis, which is ineffective governance. So my point is this. If we agreed on the top seven priorities that unite us, all of us, irrespective of party ideology, irrespective of the civil society organization you work for, whether you are a genuine civil society organization or a gongo, I'm told there, is a, there are some gongos, government-owned NGOs. The government plants people in civil society to be listening posts for the elites in power. So whether you are a genuine civil society or a gongo, can we have a conversation on things that unite us? And then we list things where we appear to disagree, where we need negotiations. But can't we find space to work on those things that unite us and ensure that we deliver? So in other words, reform success is likely to be high if we create within our political spectrum and the ecosystem a broad consensus that one, two, three, four, seven things unite all of us, irrespective of whether the head of state is which party we want to work for this, irrespective of whether the opposition sits on what platform we want to work for these things that unite us as citizens. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I am saying it's worth trying. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good deliberations. <clears throat> I've been looking at, um, at, at some of the reforms you were talking about that you think may succeed. Uh, let's just go back uh, maybe to number one, the strategy that of realigning forces and, and having uh, your reforms go through the majority voice. Do you think that this is a reform that would work uh, in, in Uganda, given our climate. I mean, I'm talking about a, a climate where the pro-democracy actors actually never want to associate with the majority voice, rightly so, because maybe they would be seen as, uh, as if they have betrayed the, the people that do support them. Do you think that this is something that would work here? It's a good deliberation, but whether it works or not, it's, it's another point. My point is that nothing is going to be easy if we are talking about democracy deepening, if we are talking about consultative approaches, if we are talking about human rights. The struggle is never easy anywhere. But the point is that there are things that are worth investing in. Our energies, our efforts, our talents. And one of those is broadening the conversation. There are many people out there who are more important to our cause than we seem to realize. Recently, I was having a conversation on the formation of a public university in Hunyoro Kitara. And we were told that there is only one giver of universities in this country, and that is the president. And we have to go to the president. Now, as a sectarian agenda, we said, who are the people we need to go with? My name, first name was Professor Puda. He said, but this one is not from your place. I said, what do you mean my place? Professor Puda was lead of the National Council for Higher Education and therefore is somebody who is passionate about university education and the benefits. I didn't succeed, but I tried. The point is that there are many times when we miss out on opportunities of making a voice that is strong on issues that matter. And, and, and I'm thinking that there are people, even within our community, who in social sciences we call significant others. There are people we underrate, but whose knowledge and whose involvement in our struggle is likely to give a lease of life to our ideas. I'm not saying it's easy. I am saying it is worth trying, ensuring that our gender is not elitist, that our gender is not seen to represent the narrow interests of people like you, shining faces, well-fed, some overfed, some of us, actually poorly fed with worms, and so we have stomachs. So, so, but, but it seems like you are children of the same mother and the same father. Why? Because you belong to a particular class. The point is that you have to take the agenda, as my friend says. We have to take the conversation to the broad spectrum of our people if we want to give it a lease of life. 
I can tell you there is no power holder, however dictatorial. There is no power holder who will not listen to you if you carry the voice of the majority. And what the power holders try to do actually is to keep you away from reaching the majority. That's why there was a struggle by Noop to get out of Kampala. The struggle by FDC to get out of Kampala because of the securitization. Why? The issue is that the power holders don't want you to link up with the majority of the people who may be peasants, who may be students, unemployed youth, who may be women suffering oppression and exploitation. But that is when somebody blocks you from something, that's why you should go. You must find a way of getting there. Thank you very much. Thank I submit. You. On a lighter note, there is no way you'll create a nudging unit like Jude described it if you don't have people who are well fed like you. <laughs> uh, to you, Sarah, how can pro reform actors maneuver the hurdles to succeed? You began by speaking about these hurdles. I mean, I, I, I ran to Africana on, on the very day of the election when uh, some of these observers of the elections were arrested. I rushed to police and, and found them all had been dumped into one police cell. You go through, as pro reform actors, you go through a lot. And I know there is also charity in the room who has uh, most likely not been in office for quite some time because Sedu was indefinitely suspended. There are a lot of hurdles that pro-reform actors go through, but how do you actually maneuver through all this for you to be able to succeed? Have we succeeded yet? No. I think we are still trying to maneuver. I, I just left Africana a few minutes before arrest was declared, but as a lawyer I had detected <laughs> that uh, however much people were pretending to have a conversation, their interest <laughs> was to arrest. And I decided that uh, all troops cannot be collected at the same time, so I took an escape route before people were declared under arrest. So I could have been... <laughs> I could have been part of the 28, a total of our civil society leaders and data entry clerks that were arrested with allegations that they were attending elections that had not taken place. You can imagine the, the mockery of, of law implementation in this country, that you are telling results of an election that has not taken place, and then you are arrested. <laughs> anyway, so how do we maneuver? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. The regime has managed to plant seeds of mistrust amongst us. Just a quick example. As, civil, as 54 civil society organizations were declared suspended, some of the few of pro-democracy NGOs that were not suspended, people started saying we are spies in our small spaces. That's how complicated it is. You, Sarah, you are always talking in the media, criticizing government, hitting hard. Why are you, why is your organization still open? No wonder you go to UBC for, for, for talk shows. <laughs> you are a spy. And of course, somebody can make it believable. I had our beneficiaries calling and saying, how come you are not on the list? <laughs> It, it is very complicated. So we have been confused and harassed to the extent that we cannot even trust each other. Even as we work on the same agenda. The same applies to political parties. That's why there is always mistrust. These are Moors, these are spies. Then the people calling others Moors, tomorrow they are in cabinet. Yes, haven't we seen these things? So that, that, that is how difficult it is. That's how the regime has managed to scatter all efforts of unity amongst civic and political actors in this country. And we are still blind to the fact that that's how the regime is managing us, by planting seeds of mistrust. How should we overcome that? We must rise above this pettiness. I call it pettiness. Because if today my organization is not closed, it does not mean that tomorrow I will survive the harassment. It is just because this time the grounds they used for harassment, they could not implicate us. It is just as simple as that. But before we rise above this pettiness amongst civic 
and political actors, then we need to embrace ourselves for more and entrench the dictatorship in this country. Uh, thank you. Maybe um, before I, I cross over again to Prof, there's, there's also, you know, away from, away from the physical push, hey, before, before I add, mm. before I, I leave that, uh, that uh, point, it is not limited to the civic and political actors. It extends to your sector, the media. NBS maneuvered to broadcast elections using some satellite connections. Everybody else called the Moors. Are we, do we still remember that? So the, the, the suspicions and the name calling and the mistrust is not limited to political actors. It extends to media. And we must deal with it. Yes. And the academics. Yeah, professor. So it, it extends to all the non-state actors. And the regime has succeeded at that. Thank you. Uh, before I, I go back to Prof, the, the, besides the physical pushback, there's also the disinterest from the state, uh, especially when these reforms are actually recommended, uh, for example, those from the Constitutional Court, uh, rather Supreme Court. How, how do you maneuver that? All these reforms actually require legal efforts. But then you also have a state that is also looking so disinterested. I know um, many uh, conversations you've had with the Office of the Attorney General to be able to present these uh, reforms on the floor of Parliament, but the office looks disinterested. How do you maneuver such uh, a hurdle? Well, we have to prepare for high costs of litigation. I know that the Chitiocha Katiba might not be in the room, but together with the Professor Sempe and Professor Juko, they were able to go back to the Supreme Court and ensure there is enforcement of the recommendations. There are still three pending recommendations, and we need to contact the good professors to go back to the Supreme Court and remind them that the electoral reforms that were enacted on their directives we have three pending issues and the fourth one on timelines. So we need to run that campaign and, and maybe also fundraise because it's not cheap. Public interest litigation costs are expensive. We are also faced with a judiciary that we mistrust. I had they left them out on, on uh, the, the trust levels with the judiciary are limited. Some people are doing a very good job as usual. Others are serving the interests of the people that appoint them. And you can see through their decisions that they make. And know that this one has made a cadre decision, this one has made a legal decision. So we have that challenge at that level. But we cannot give up, as I have stated. The same way we continue engaging as civil society actors, the same way we still have political parties and academia and media, is the same way we shall still engage with the judiciary, and if you get a bad decision, proceed to another court and challenge that decision. We cannot give up on our country. We do not have any other country. I don't know how many people in this room have dual citizenship. Personal, I don't, and I'm not interested in dual citizenship. I only belong to Uganda, and I have one country to fight for, for the betterment of future generations to come. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Associate Professor Julius Chiza, how do the pro-reform actors maneuver the hurdles to be able to succeed? These are the same actors that have failed to um, put together constructive dialogue. Yes, can I remind you and be brutally honest? It is not in the selfish interest of the elites misgoverning you to reform or to leave power. So it is not in their selfish interest. It is you to cause them to reform. Now, Nelson Mandela, who worked in the context of a more repressive regime than you have ever seen, than you have ever lived under, said that, you see, he has the conviction that truth temporarily defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. So, and that kept him in the struggle. He said, you can disrupt me now. You can bruise me, but in so long as you're bruising me on the wrong side of history, ultimately, the rights of the people and the voices of the people will gain an upper hand in the long term. Now, that means that pro-reformers must be able to shift their focus from the short run to the long term. 
Some of us go into struggles expecting results in one year of registration of your civil society. Two years, three years. My friend, that is an illusion. Many of the governance reforms and the struggles for human rights, the struggles for constitutional governance, for the rule of law, these are struggles that are achieved over a long time horizon. So please shift. The first thing is to encourage reformers to adopt an ideology of long-term struggles, not short-term outcomes. In fact, you have achieved more than you seem to recognize. So number two is to celebrate what you have achieved. The, the citizen, having a citizen's manifesto is an important thing. To say these are organizing principles of civil society and citizens. The idea that you are pushing the regime, even if it was a procedural reform, to move from a one-party democracy, I don't know whether you want to call it a one-party democracy or one-party dictatorship, that move was, did not happen by accident. It was a product of struggles. You under-celebrate what you have achieved. The idea that you are able to cause certain reforms to happen, even under difficult circumstances, is an idea that we must celebrate what you have achieved because that gives you the morale to struggle even harder. Number three, we need to ally with like minds. I want to emphasize that the idea, if the idea of having seven, eight, nine political parties confronting one force appears to weaken their fighting capacity. How about the idea of having a republic of NGOs? Does it strengthen you or weaken you? Is it not possible for some of these NGOs to get together, mobilize your human capital, mobilize your budgets and resources, and push an agenda that is formidable? So, so the, the idea that your little islands in the ecosystem dominated by a repressive regime might actually weaken you. What's wrong with signing contracts and merging some of these like-minded NGOs so that we work together instead of appearing to be creating spaces? Yes, please, some advice. We started during elections and formed the new you, which was a coalition of NGOs to combine human and financial resources and collective observer elections, and we are immediately banned. But, and, and we went to court and lost, and we are, we are reviving grounds of appeal. Yes, thank you for the advice, and I like this. You see, a coalition is important, and I think that was an achievement, to get these forces together. And the fact that you are banned doesn't mean the struggle has ended. But, but more importantly, I am saying, instead of a coalition means we are associating, but we are not united. True or false? It's like a confederation of East African community countries. A confederation is a loose alliance. What we need is a federation, which means you are uniting politically and economically. In the world of NGOs, I'm saying, does it not make sense to unite, to unite, form a front, which is stronger, because the other power is strong. So for you to have a lease of life and to push the reform agenda, I think you need to invest in unity. I am not pretending at all that it's going to be easy, but I'm saying some of these investments may be worth your effort and your investment. I, I also wish to point out that we need to occupy spaces. There are so many spaces governance spaces, legislative spaces, spaces of service delivery. Wouldn't it make sense if an NGO here organized a campaign to clean the city? That, that our NGO has said every Saturday, we are saying, government, you are incompetent. Rwanda is cleaning. Sorry, it is, is it called sacrilegious? Any Catholic here? <laughs> is it sacrilegious to talk about Rwanda doing a good thing in Uganda today? Oh, okay, excuse me, I didn't say it, and I hope you didn't hear it. But I'm saying, if your neighbor is doing something good, like cleaning your neighborhood every day, one day in a month, one day in a week, why wouldn't civil society say, look, we are not about politics. We are about better livelihoods and good neighborhoods. So we are organizing people to clean. And we put aside a day. I will join you. And we clean. 
And then we are sending a message to local government in that jurisdiction that actually things can happen. How about the idea of skilling the youth? Some of you have a lot of knowledge. Some of you have the networks. Wouldn't your NGO speak to the needs of the voters, the political actors, if you do something that solves their problem? So I, I am just pointing to things that are likely to enable us to improve our value addition to the lives of, of our citizens. I finally want to say that we need to address the issue of financing. Because many civil society organizations are weakened by the fact that, like the governments we critique, civil societies are donor dependent. Is it possible for us to develop a financing strategy that enables you to win off donor support? Yes, we need donors. In short run, donations are okay. Medium term, okay. But long term, we need to win off. And I had a chance to work with one civil society organization represented in town to work within East Africa. I'll not mention names because I left the NGO, but I don't want them to think that I'm too critical of them. I did suggest they get a budget of about $20 million in any one year, and, I, and they rent. And I say, and when you look at the expenditure on, on rent, and, and I said, look, if you're in business for the long haul, why don't you get a portion of this income and build your own home? Have your own office space so that whenever you get funding for office space, you're paying yourselves. Why do you have to live in rented space? Am I speaking to some NGOs here? For the huge budgets you get, can't you get a portion of that money and buy a plot of land first year? Maybe second year, put up a structure. Maybe complete in five years. So that you win off the aid. The idea that without office space, we can't work. Anyway, COVID has also shown that you may not need the brick and mortar office. You need a digital office. But I think we can use our resources creatively and be able to, 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 to increase our value addition. And very finally, I'm arguing that we improve our likelihood of succeeding when we forge alliances across a broad spectrum. Please, I'm inviting you to appreciate that not everybody in government is your enemy. Not everybody in the other NGO you don't like is your enemy you can actually work together on several things. You may not agree 100% on everything, but success normally happens when you demonstrate that there are certain things that unite you and that you can work for those. Then negotiate those things where you disagree. Because politics is about compromise at certain levels. I'm not saying negotiate away your fundamental principles. No, I am saying stand on your fundamental principles. But be able to identify things that you can negotiate. Give and take. Maintaining your fundamentals, aligning with others, with a compromise approach on things you can negotiate, then you're going to be more impactful. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are right on time to open the discussion to the plenary. If you have any comments, any questions for the panelists here, this would be the right time. Okay, so someone wants to help me move the mic. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jude, for the presentation, uh, Prof and Sarah also for the discussion. I just have a few comments to make and perhaps a few questions. My name is Okidi Christopher. Uh, I'm a lawyer in Kampala here, but formerly the national youth leader of the Democratic Party. Uh, they say politicians don't retire, but I retired. Yeah. Um, I think the salvation of this country will come from the common man. That one we should agree. Because when you look at countries like England, uh, people were mobilized around the Anti-Corn Law League by Cobden. And that's because it was affecting the common man, 
the common man eventually had to uh, form a coalition with the then middle class to cause uh, so far England's second most important change after the 1213 English Magna Carta. So this tells us that as long as the common man is out of any agitation in this country, we should forget uh, every other discussion about changing this country. Uh, there are very many examples, even in, in Ireland, when Ireland was breaking away from the United Kingdom, MacDonnell mobilized the people around the issues of the day, which was famine in Ireland. So I think political actors and civil society just need to get to the common man. And that therefore brings me to the question of the middle class that Jude uh, brought about, uh, brought in his discussion. Each time I talk about the middle class, or each time we are talking about the middle class in Africa, uh, there is this very important statement by Paul Sutter, who actually uh, gave a forward to Franz Fanon's black skin, white masks. And you know what he said? He said that African middle class and elite seem not to be communicating with the masses of Africans. Why? Their, their mouth is always full of jargons, of their funders and where they obtain their education. And to me, I think this is actually the biggest problem. Because we have a host of political parties, civil society, creating even dichotomies has pro-change, we are pro-change, and the other ones are, I don't know what, what they are. Now, these dichotomies does not, like Professor Kiza said, does not create a buy-in of progressive forces that are there, because you're already saying, we are the pro-democracy, the other ones are now the pro-dictatorship. Now, I think these are some of the dynamics that, uh, that we definitely need to, to change. First of all, this country, by the way, Uganda, and democracy. Democracy, by the way, needs more deliberation than debate. Because in debate, you're going to be winning points against the other group, and, and yet in deliberation, you can have policy takeaways, you can have certain agreements and common and collective action that you can work on. So I think this country also needs more deliberation than in debate. Uh, secondly, when we talk about uh, the middle class and civil society, I, I find no di distinction between the middle class and civil society because of their, appro their approach to agitation in this country. Uh, first of all, they need to reach the common man because Professor Juko and Dr. Tindifa wrote a book called The People's Dialogue. And in that book, there was an indictment on the political elite and civil society, saying that these civil societies are not membership-based. Because they are not membership-based, they lack, first of all, the legitimacy. In fact, they are run on a social enterprise model. Because they are not membership-based, they lack the... Actually, what, what they actually lack is the membership, the critical mass, the numbers to make any meaningful agitation. So I think civil society, when we talk about civil society in Uganda, uh, civil society also needs some restructuring if it is to make some sense in terms of membership to ensure that it can uh, provide better uh, agitation in this country. So I think those are the very important points that I wanted to touch on, but also I want to give you a quote by former Czech Republic president, uh, what's his name? Havel Vaklav. He said that uh, sometimes we need to find the national soul of the country. I think all all these problems of terrorism, 
dem, dem, democratic reversal. That is if we have had de democracy anyway, because some of us actually think Uganda has never been democratic. But all these problems can only be solved when we find our national soul. What is the national soul of this country? What are the values? I think that is what we need to invest more in it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Canary, and uh, good morning to everyone. I want to start at two places. Thank you very much, Jude Obitire, for your presentation. I think it was high level, highly intellectual, because it gave us pointers that, one, our actions need not be incremental. They need to be incremental rather than sudden. And I think you also urged us to see the collective in the issues that are around us. Right now we have what we call the red card people's front. Then we have Bobby Wine who has gone back to the field to touch base with Ugandans. But then we also had the Citizens Manifesto which you've heard being alluded to by Professor uh, Julius Chiza. And um, all these efforts have been uh, piecemeal. I think what I want to hear from you is how do we put the dots together such that one concerted effort pushes us to the ultimate agenda. The Kenyans did what they called a constitutional review process for a period of 10 years. They united behind that process. And out of that process, right now, an ordinary Kenyan has a say over the governance of their country. It doesn't matter what is happening around us if we do not pay attention to politics. Governance determines everything else. Of course, I had Professor Kiza, and I want to come back to him on that one. He said, you know, if you go to the people and you don't tell them about the food which they want to eat, then what are you telling them about? Are they going to eat politics? Kabuleta in 2021 was talking economic empowerment. And he tried to explain to the people that, they, that when you talk economics, then you're talking politics. Because politics is economics. And economics is politics. I want to also add that beyond economics being politics and politics being economics, security is politics. And politics is not exclusive to, ex to security. Okay? So all these forces are, they are fluid. They are fluid. One influences the other. So Kabletta tried that agenda. It didn't work. Abed Buanika tried that agenda earlier in 2016. It didn't work. So we don't have a one-size-fits-all. I like the way you argued, Professor. The reason I like the way you argued is because you remained modest in approach. And you also agitated for a change in strategy, which is what we've been struggling with as civil society organizations. Of course, I will not go without saying SEDU, which I am the executive director, is right now closed. But it has not stopped us from thinking, one. Two, it has not stopped us from operating. We operate in our houses. I don't need to sit in that office where NGO Bureau is in charge of closing. No, I have my computer in my car anytime I will be on it. And I have made more alliances right now with the outside world than I did when I was closed in an office space. So thank you very much, NGO Bureau. Please close more offices such that we get more of think tanks and think processes going. I want to close at the following four things that you said. Uh, Jude, you said civic disengagement. It has been one of our key problems. And I think if we are able to fix this civic disengagement, we will be in a good direction on our democracy spectrum. Two, I would like you to paint a picture for us. 
when we look at the UN plan of action to end impunity against military control in African politics, because you said it's not just a Ugandan thing. And Sarah raised it and said, look, in 2021, everything was militarized. In fact, at one point, people were dying like flies. November, December were a dangerous month to participate in the political processes of Uganda. January, people were being closed. Up to now, we have lives that have not been accounted for. Those are dangerous things in a political economy. So what do we do if we look at the UN plan of action and the end to military control? What advice do you give Ugandans? And I think Professor Julius, because you also believe in political economy, please highlight on that. Thank you, Kanuri. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Jeremiah Keamwanje. I'm currently a council at State Hall, representing the people of Kasubi and a member of the National Inter Platform. I want to thank you, Akfim and everybody, uh, for your passion. I'm actually shocked that you're even discussing electoral reforms at this time. Many civil societies cannot dare. We in politics are about to abandon the word electoral reforms because we don't seem to see it. We just want to erase it from our dictionary. Because even if you get all these reforms and you achieve them, at the end of the day, they will not act according to the book. The real action will be contrary and against and completely in a different direction. I have heard your cries here. You are crying to the citizenry. You are saying we should take this debate to the grassroots and to the street. This debate can't do anything in the grassroots and the street. When I was in rooms like this before, this election season that has just ended, I used to think it was possible. But when I went and acted in politics this last election season, now, all this debate cannot help us. What can help us is if you fold your sleeves and go and act. Somebody was blaming me for allowing Seglinia to contest when he doesn't have academic requirements. And I simply told him, if you don't want to run, then you allow those who are not educated to rule you. Just sit back with your books, professors, and be taken for a ride. And don't blame anyone. I have seen the media and civil sat and everybody saying Chagulani is half-baked. Then you is full-baked. You are seated in your boardrooms and discussing in very cool environments like this. And you want to blame Chagulani for not being full-baked. So, I think that civil society and the elite you are in your different world. We are also in our different world. We are all in Uganda. At least the geographical jurisdiction is the same. But the world we are speaking about, the two worlds we are speaking about are completely different. I just don't know where that mismatch comes from. But when you sit in a meeting in Kamocha and sit in a meeting here, just even by mere entering the room, the difference is very clear. The type of debate, my brother here has left politics. Now you hear what he's speaking. Books, professors, <laughs> freeze the family. This professor quoting after quote. <laughs> now how can we quote like this and then we get power? I, have, I was hearing Professor Julia speaking and he was saying that we should get power brokers like Salim Saleh and speak to them. Salim Saleh, who has gotten this country and tainted it with madness? who has made a bureaucratic government system informal. Money now is just taken in sacks wherever he goes. He has shifted the capital city of Uganda to wherever he goes. When he goes to Guru, Guru becomes the capital for that time. If he stays in a forest, everybody is camped around the forest, eating money from Saleh, making the army take over everything. The whole country has been militarized. 
everything. We have even security forces. We have, for example, prison services. But when you go to their gate, you find the army, UPDF. They have guns. They also go through training. But they have to be guarded by the army. And just don't understand what's going on in the country. So for me, what I think, uh, that we people who are wearing suits and who are happy to speak this nice English and read books, we should accept and go and struggle and liberate this country. We fold our sleeves. If we continue thinking that by writing reports... Now, ACFIM last time was, had a very good study on political financing. And I walked with them the entire way during their reports and studies and suggestions. And I don't think we achieved even uh, half of what we wanted. But even if we had achieved it, you saw how this election happened. No, there was no regard to even the law that is in existence. Not even a single section of the law. So what will the reforms help us? They will not help us anything. Let's fold our sleeves, go to the street, leave this comfort, and then we'll get the Uganda we want. But if we don't, nobody is begging anyone to do it. If we don't, the Sigrinias are there. They will do it for us. And don't comment on your social media in the comfort of your bedrooms that how did Segrinya become an MP? Where were you when Segrinya was becoming an MP? What were you doing? So for us as National Day Platform, what we have done, we have gotten the power to liberate this country and we have given it to every nobody. You go and do whatever you want. If you are a tomato seller and you think you can do anything about this country, go. Compete for anything you want, do it your way and get your country back. That's what we are thinking about. Because these reports, we don't see anything in them. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I will come to the second round of the, of the plenary session, but for now, I want to recognize uh, two members of parliament who are joining us online. Uh, Honorable Akuguziwe, a lead uh, member of parliament for Ruli County, Masindi District, and uh, Honorable Obusinge Jowab, member of parliament for Masindi Municipality. Um, I'll come for the second round of the plenary, but first, I want to engage you, Sarah, um, if you have any last remarks uh, before you leave us and some of uh, the replies to the comments you just had. Yeah, thank you very much, Kanai. First, I will uh, briefly respond to my friend, Okid Christopher, who has uh, become more philosophical. Than <laughs> yes, we must connect with the issues of the day, I agree. We need more deliberation than debate. There have been numerous efforts in this country fostering dialogue. B but the, the people we want to dialogue with who hold power and who are entrenching state capture are not interested. In the last meeting where we thought the interreligious group had made progress, they agreed to the statement, discussed the the, the, you know, the statement, which was two page, the, the communique for two months, led by now the then advisor, the office of the prime minister, who is the executive director of KCCA, and the outgoing deputy attorney general, Mwesigwarukutana, and the president agreed with the formation of the, or the write-up of the communique. And when the meeting of leaders went, thinking it was a signing ceremony, it ended up in a Photoshop moment and the president said he will sign and share the communicate, kickstart the national dialogue process at the grassroots. It has never been seen again. So who do you want to dialogue with and are they interested? Just out of the electoral violence after announcing of elections and the standoff at the Robert Chagrani's home, there were calls for dialogue with even international actors. The Commonwealth team fruit Uganda on the request of the head of state of Uganda. So the Secretary General of Commonwealth sent, sent an advance team 
And among the advance team was the Director for Democracy and Human Rights at the Commonwealth Secretariat in, in London. He happened to have a meeting with civic actors then. They were held for about three days without meeting the person who had invited them. And the message was that they should instead meet the minister. And the people said, no, but you are the one who invited us here to help you with the dialogue with the Robert Chagrin. Late after the meeting, they've never come back again. And the president went to the media and said, he knows the address of everybody. If he wants to talk to the people, he will call them and he knows where to find them. So who are you going to dialogue with, my friend? Middle class and civil society. There's nothing wrong with civil society being in, in the middle class. And nobody says that civil society should be dominated by people who are, who are also helpless or vulnerable. We work with the vulnerable and disadvantaged and marginalized groups. And in most cases, apart from public litigation and policy objectives and issues like the one we are sharing here, 90% of our work is to help the vulnerable, marginalized, and disadvantaged groups in Uganda at the front of human rights, land rights with massive evictions, etc., etc., health rights, access to education. We work with marginalized and vulnerable people. So should we say these spaces then should be dominated by these vulnerable and marginalized people? No. Anybody can be a member of civil society whether you have upper class, middle class, low income, we should all work together after all it's a cause for the common good of the country. Civil society organizations exist basically to make sure that the rich are not too powerful to buy off the poor and the poor are not too needy to sell themselves. That's the space we mitigate and occupy. And we can come from all the three classes of the economy, poor, middle, uh, uh, and first class income earners, except we don't have the first class owners of Uganda joining us. I think that's where there is a missing gap. Maybe those are the people we need to, to mobilize. Legitimacy of civil society, should it come from membership groups? I disagree totally. Civil society organizations are volunteer groups. The volunteer groups can be, the volunteer citizens can be in big numbers, can be small numbers, so long as you are two people and more. There is no limit on the maximum. And you cannot limit the minimum beyond two people. Because what would be your intention? We know the challenges membership organizations have had in this country, the latest being the collapse of Hurinet, the biggest, most effective human rights network of Uganda. As we talk now, it's just a building because they had purchased a building like a uh, professor was advising here on why don't we get in incomes and purchase buildings. And maybe at that point I can go briefly also to respond to him. In most cases we use volunteer resources from our donors. If you have discussed and agreed and passed a budget with a donor, that this is a contribution to rent or administration. And we account for every penny. We do not have classified expenditure, like our government, which takes trillions in classified expenditures. We account for every penny. Now we have gone cashless. Even for me to get fuel to come here, it must come through a system that is monitored by the people that send us their volunteer contributions. So to change these budget lines, it is not easy. You must agree with the consortium of donors that contribute to your rent. And they must authorize you to use that money for purchase. Most of these charity organizations do not support asset acquisition. So as much as it sounds as a bright idea, but whose money are you going to spend? They do not support asset acquisition. Most of these charity organizations, if not all. I think you have only a few exceptions with like two donors that I know of that can support you to acquire assets beyond office computers. So that's the challenge that we have, and it's not our making until we generate more resources and are able to fund ourselves. I, as I conclude, I agree with the challenge Je Jeremiah has posed on the apathy of the elite. 
we look at politics as a dirty game and indeed it's dirty and we do not want to dirty in our hands. Even activism in this country is very dirty and people don't want to dirty in their hands. Many people call me, especially from the regime where I have some friends, but you, why don't you stop talking? Can't you go home and raise your children? And that is what they want to achieve. As if me doing my work stops me from raising my children. The level of intimidation that we go through including close family and friends, because now activism in this country is dirtier than politics. But we are not going to surrender. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, but before, before I come to you, uh, Prof, I want to give a moment to uh, Jude to respond to some of uh, the comments that came in from the plenary. It looks like many speakers actually are alluding to the fact that many pro-democracy actors have made the message about themselves other than the message itself. Thank you, Kanavi. Um, I don't mind any color. I'm colorblind. Uh, good morning once again. Um, I think I've taken a lot of feedback uh, from those who have responded to the paper that I presented. And again, I want to reiterate that that paper will be available through ACFIM so that you can internalize it and also query it. I also want to recognize Professor being Chitovu Obi like me. I was also Chitovu. So interesting that there seems to be a lot of energy coming in from the equator. So thank you for revealing that information. Uh, just to make it very clear is that, and I'll speak from a perspective of war or defense studies, is that before you go to battle, you must know your enemy. And, and I think one of the things that's eluding our civil society is to fail to understand the other side. And those who come close to understanding the other side do it with a lot of bias and also a lot of speculation. You need to understand the person you're confronting before you start taking that fight to that person. Now, that leads me to strategy. Strategy is a totality of all factors. You cannot leave anything behind. It's the political, it's the economical, it's the social, it's the military, it's everything. Whenever you sit in civil society and you have one dimension strategy, you are in trouble. You are in big trouble because all governments that control power ruthlessly and determinedly, as the current regime does, thinks in wholesome and they think very, very aggressively in containing those who come towards them. And then also you need to understand the habits of your actor. When you look at President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni and General Paul Kagame, you attempt to understand two things. There's a lot of organization mm -hmm. discipline. And this comes after years of spending life as gorillas before they became mm -hmm. statesmen. Mm -hmm. There's something that I see in civil society. Like a colleague from said, who said, you tend to have sudden plans. You need to transition to having strategic discipline. Strategic discipline means that you need to have the willpower, the means, and organization capacity to see through long-term plans which can stretch even beyond the five-year strategic plan that you are commonly used to in your boardrooms. Where I'm seated today, Professor, and I can tell this without any uncertainty, someone to think that he can offload the NRM regime in a five-year plan is actually having the biggest dream of his life. You need to sit on the side and plan, and that means you have got to sacrifice. You don't go to the battle plan, the battlefield in a suit. You need to get dirty. <laughs> And then you need to commit your time and resources as well as your willpower to deal with this set. But I also want to go back to what Professor said. Sometimes we tend to fight wars that we cannot win. Sun Tzu, whom I don't like quoting a lot because he's been misused in many disciplines, business, anywhere, says you don't start a war that you cannot complete. If you are going to agitate for power, don't agitate for a three-year plan and then you quit politics. You've got to agitate and stay there. And some of you are losing your best resources because they come in to survive, and as soon as they realize some meaningful goals, they are off to another profession. Now, 
you've talked about the issue of how do we do it sustainably. It all comes down to two things. The voters are the population, and that population is a strata of different people. You've got the young, you've got the middle, and you've got the old and all that. And they're dispersed around this whole country. This country is very small, like Professor Kiza said. It's a very small country. And sometimes people ask me, sometimes you speak fearlessly. I've not earned money in this economy for 13 years, but I pay my taxes. So I'm at liberty to speak the way I want. I pay taxes promptly, and I don't pay cheap taxes. I pay, they tax me heavily. All my income is from abroad, but they tax it. So at a certain point in time, you as citizens of Uganda need to understand that you have your rights shelved within the Constitution, but also when you exercise those rights, you need to exercise them with discipline. And that's why I don't believe in riots, because it's a bit of a sudden thing. You need to be deliberate on how you do your things. He talked about Jeno Salim Saleh, and some of you rubbished it off. Those who do business, and I think it's taught in business school, you can either compete or you can co-opt. It's what they call competition, competition. You need to transition between those two things. And Raila Odinga is doing that successfully. Raila Odinga is doing that successfully. Today, Uhuru Kenyatta hates Ruto more than he would hate anything, than Odinga. You must be able to work with the government. The Tanzanians in Chama Chama Pinduzi have got a saying that the ideology of Sajib, support any government in power so that things can go well. I found that from my friend, unfortunately, he died during this COVID mess in Tanzania. And he told me, you've got to be near government to understand how it works, and then you can influence either from within or without. So any Kasare attempt, like someone tried to point it there, that this dialogue might be a waste of time, it's not a waste of time. You learn many things from this kind of dialogue, and then you can be able to build synergies and ideas towards sustainable uh, engagement with government and your donors. Now, someone asked about the United Nations. I'm, I'm always very, very quizzical about the UN. It's a very amorphous organization, and for you to expect them to bring us any solution to this country other than the usual, I, I talk about sustainable development goals it would be a very hard sell. Ugandans must learn that help must come from within, not from without. I don't think any country in Europe today, or even America itself, is willing to engage in terms of helping you to change power. The little money that we receive in terms of aid, that aid is not a favor. It's part of their diplomacy and statecraft to control certain things that include their strategic interests, which are, again, not short-term, but long-term. The Chinese have done that. The Americans are doing it. So in a nutshell, for the people in civil, service, you must, civil society, you must know the population you are playing it. Those who have started insurgencies and revolution wars, you have to go, to go back to Algeria when Trinke was there, brutal as he was, the beast of Paris. He divided society into pink and white spaces. You need to understand what is the pink and what is white. Taba talks about, and that is the war, and he says the war with the flea or what others guy called Nago says, you must eat soup with a knife. If you don't control population, that's where the fish swims. If you don't have engagement with the population, don't waste time in politics. It's as simple as that. You must be as close to the population as possible and not just during election times. For Paul Francis, when reminding the Catholic priests, when he became as a priest, as a, as a prelate, and the Bishop of Rome, he said the bishop, a priest or a bishop must smell like sheep. You cannot be a bishop and you smell like roses. If you are an activist, you must smell like sheep. You must be close to that. And that is where I think the disconnect happens. President Yuri Kavutam Seveni, whom I've studied very well, and I admire him, by the way, because he's very deliberate on what he does. I remember Professor Kiza, when we were doing the inaugural Nelson Mandela uh, seminar in Makere, he asked us, but who is there? He asked that question, show me that person, and I'll hand over power. He was very deliberate. He said, show me that person. I mean, if we are at that level where we have leaders who cannot match your, your enemy, then you are in trouble. Finally, and this one I'll go back to the rumble in the jungle, how Muhammad Ali may so rest in peace fought with Reverend George Ford Farmer and the rope adopt strategy which has been used a lot in the military science. Muhammad Ali was smaller. 
and he used the ropes to his advantage. He tired Foreman until such a time when Foreman could not fight anymore. He kept on telling me, hit me, hit me, until Foreman got frustrated and then he lost the war. How many of you are harassing government using smaller methods? It's methods like this, you're harassing government. Coming into this discussion, I was seated with Professor Kiza talking and he said, you will not be surprised that there are people in this room who are taking every note. Who is this Judo Butre suddenly? Where has he been? Or why is Professor Kiza here? Because they feel that in these senses, in these kind of forums, you have new energies. So just utilize the small places that you have, and then the end is possible. So I think for me, that is my contribution. Again, any struggle that is sudden is a failure. Any struggle that lacks strategic discipline in its totality is not going to be meaningful. And anything that lacks the full strategic dimension will lack anything. It must be political, it must be economical, it must be financial, it must be everything that you can master to bring to the battlefield. And then, once you have everything there, then you can focus on what they call your main attack, where do you want to go? That main attack is your population. When I say the main attack does not mean that you get a machete or a panga. Spend time with engaging your population and start with activities like this and selling your message and then you can then smell like sheep as Pope, John Paul tells, as Pope Francis tells us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jude, for uh, that brilliant submission. Uh, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Prof, to respond to some of the comments. OK, thank you very much, uh, our Master of Ceremony. I, I, I'm not very sure I know what I should say and not say, but I have had the vibrance in the room, and I appreciate all your ideas. I think most of them are compliments, a few questions, a few observations. But let me go in no particular order to say that I have heard members saying fold the sleeves and let's do what needs to be done to create a new dispensation. And that is a refreshing reminder of the views of Chancellor von Bismarck, who was tired of debates and debates and conversations. Chancellor von Bismarck of Germany said, and I quote, the issues of the day will not be determined by debates and majority deliberations, but by iron and blood. Now the question becomes, if it is easy to agree among the community of civil society actors that the solution to our crisis lies in bailing the cut, how many of us are ready to volunteer to go and bail the cut? You know the risks involved. You know the risks. You may never return if you are the one to bail the cart. But, but this is the conversation I'm being reminded of. I wanted to say this comment to my friend who has just left on civil society. Many donors want to give you three calls to rent. They want you to stay a tenant, not to become a landlord. Some will give you three calls so that, like government, you become donor dependent. Now, I want to let you know that in the donor world, as in political economy spaces, you get what you demand, not what you deserve. Let me be clear. Even in diplomacy, you get what you negotiate, not necessarily what you deserve. If you affirm and say we need this percentage of our budget going to this, you'll be able to get a funder who is happy to do that. And you have, of course, to present your unique selling proposition. Why do you want a permanent office space? Why would you like to shift from the culture of renting? It is easy to justify. But even if they didn't, can you creatively use your budgets and say this percentage should go to this? So, so you get what you negotiate, not necessarily what you demand. I know of NGOs who have been able to do that. They are able to acquire their own property. And, and I'm sure you can also do it. Okay, now I go to this question uh, from my friend Okidi. Salvation for our country, for our region, for our continent, I guess, lies with the common man. Why didn't you add the common woman? I don't know. But I'm sure you also meant common woman. The common people, the people, the majority. Yes, you're speaking to Article 1 of the Constitution of the Republic of Uganda, which says all power, all power held by duty bearers belongs to the people and shall be exercised in accordance with 
law established. Not the wishes of a presidential monarch, not the wishes of an executive. But I want to urge caution. While the majority of the people are key actors, yes, we appreciate they are co-authors of their destiny. They need leadership. If you don't provide leadership, and the leadership for the majority normally comes from the intelligentsia, from the middle class. Why? Karl Marx cautions us. Peasants are like sacks of potatoes. They are rooted in their soil, just like their crops. They hardly see the problem of peasants and many low class groups is that their ideology does not go beyond their village. They, they, they have never seen good. All they believe in is something parochial. They believe in ethnic identity. They believe in things they are accustomed to. So the, the crisis we have is that many of the people in public politics actually carry the ideology of the peasantry, thinking that the best persons I can work with are those from my sub-county. And if you think I'm wrong, you check the three-starred police officers and tell me whether they are not cousin brothers or cousin sisters. But that's an ideology of the peasantry. The idea that I can only work with people of my ethnic identity. So, so peasants are significant, the majority are important, but they need to be given leadership. And that leadership comes from you and me and people whose ideology is much better than them. Now, can I come to this issue? My friend from Sedu is saying a lot of work has been done. Yes, we appreciate. And she's not here, so she's not listening. I will speak in the hope that while the, her body is not here, her spirit will be able to hear. And she's saying we have done a lot, and that's for a fact. How do we connect the dots? For me, the answer appears clear. Please, you don't need only to work hard. Yes, work hard. But can you, speaking the language of my students who are youth, that we are not just working hard, we are working smart. So I'm dreaming of smart civil society. Society that leverages digital spaces to continue with your civil society work. Society that organizes elections and campaigns and programs digitally. And I think we are doing that already. But I think that's what we need to deepen. To ensure that whereas you might have a meeting of 30 people, you are speaking to 43 million within Uganda, within the region, and several others outside the continent. So we need to leverage the digital spaces. But I hasten to add two or three things that we can do differently to connect the dots. The idea of strategic planning has been emphasized by the keynote speaker. So we need to occupy that space of strategic planning. As individual civil society organizations, I think we are already there. But I think what seems to need emphasis is to say, can we sit together? If we are all governance, civil society organizations, can we sit together and draw a strategic plan for all of us? And in this strategic plan, can we identify the top five to seven interventions that we want to embark upon? Can we identify the source of funding? Don't just dream. You need to plan for your activities. And can we allocate responsibilities within our club of civil society organizations doing governance work? Who will be responsible for what? And quickly add, do we have a monitoring mechanism to be able to tell us whether they are doing it or not doing it? And then the difficult thing is Kagame style. Can we put sanctions? What do we do with those members? We've given assignments. We've asked to do deliverables. Maybe we have jointly mobilized the resources and given them their portion. What do we do to them if they don't deliver? Are there sanctioning mechanisms? If we work smart, we are going to connect the dots and become more significant in the spaces we do occupy. Now, allow me to comment on this issue of, of Geno Saleh. I, I know Geno Saleh is a, a controversial uh, personality. I didn't say he's an angel because he's not. But when I mention an actor like Geno Saleh, what I'm inviting you to appreciate is that I don't need the blood and body of genocide. What I mean is for you to do your homework and identify an actor. 
I gave you this actor because he's significant. The actor you identify who will give a lease of life to your ideas must be a significant actor, must be a gatekeeper. Policy and politics are competitive. The priorities are different. So you need an actor. It could be somebody else. But you need an actor who will be a power broker. If you want to give a lease of life to your ideas, I am not saying they are angels. I hardly see angels in government. I don't see them. But do we avoid them because we are holier than the Holy Spirit? Should we avoid them? Or is there a way of doing strategic engagement? I am not saying sacrifice your principles. I am saying many of the people we are critical of, we have never met them. We have never had a conversation with them. And usually our knowledge of them is from secondary sources. And if it is from the newspapers, Canary, I think you'll tell me if I'm right or wrong, the journalists normally report about sensational stories. They hardly tell us the good things. Now, I'll give an example of something I saw working because I did a study on the political economy of GMO resistance in this country. The president is pro-science. You know that. The president is pro-science. A couple of civil society organizations are against GM technology. And they are pushing organics as an alternative. But the GMO technology is saying you don't have to use GMO to produce food. You can use GMO to produce fiber for industrial raw materials. Not necessarily food. We can leave the food untouched. Now what happens for the groups that were pushing for GMO, they actually reached up to the top the topmost office in the land. And they had the ears of the top. What did other organizers do? They said, okay, Caritas. Anybody knows Caritas? Catholic affiliated. They said, we are going to ally with the first lady. And we are going to tell the first lady that God and God alone is the author of life. That God as author of life does not need co-authors called GM scientists. So these fellows push their ideas and their influence and their lobbying powers through the first lady. Guess what? Because of bedroom politics, I guess. The big man said, no, 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 you know, we are not signing this thing. We are. Bedroom politics is very infectious. And it works. So I'm giving you this example, not for the other purpose of the GM research. I'm giving it as an example of what you could do to identify progressive forces that you can work with to push your agenda. You are not going to wish away the people in office. Yes, you can do the Chancellor von Bismarck, iron and blood. And that is one option which is given to the citizen because it's in the constitution. But there is the other option which might be less disruptive but quite effective. And that is trying to identify actors who may constitute your gamekeepers and give a lease of life to your ideas. The option you eventually take is basically yours. Can I comment, I think finally, on this issue of Abed Wanika, who talked the language of economic empowerment, and then Kabuleta follows in a subsequent electoral season and talks about economic empowerment. And my friend from Sedu said, look, they never succeeded. Now, that is a misinterpretation of competitive politics. The fact that you do not win in any one competitive game doesn't mean you have lost. What it means is that you have postponed your victory. So Kabuleta never lost. Neither did Abed Wanika. It is just that the electoral season gave them an opportunity to hone their skills, to be able to identify which kinds of ideas get acceptance, but also to see their mistakes. Perhaps one lesson they may have learned if they were observing politics the way I was is that it is very fruitless to go it alone. If you have a great idea on economic empowerment of the citizens, and I think that's great, you need to ally with other political parties so that your manifesto also puts on board certain other ideas which will give a lease of life to your campaign strategy. So I want to submit chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for speaking about the role and uh, relevance and the power of actors in the success of reforms.
And thanks to you, Jude, on speaking about uh, the place of compromise in, in the success of reforms. I'll, I'll just get in maybe three more comments, maybe one from online. Um, Vincent Babiesza, BACA coordinator, says that the purpose of reform is one, let's build a strong evidence best. Even if you know something is true, but there is no evidence to support your assertion or policy proposal, relax your case. And he goes ahead to say, let's align our proposals with international standards and review mechanisms. And he says that let's build capacity and learn from peers. Learning never ends. No one is too old to learn and no one is too young to teach in advocacy campaigns. We ought to address restrictive social norms and stereotypes for purposes of inclusive and participatory decision making. And he concludes by saying, sequence policies towards gradual legal reforms. I have another comment online here, coming in from uh, Oriem Edison. Goes to, to Sarah and Chiza, in this struggle, politics is our backbone. So what should political parties and individuals share in common, which is beyond unrealistic? I guess he meant alliance, which has caused more division among citizens. Uganda must be liberated. Okay, uh, let me pick more two comments or three. Yes, Emma, at the back and him, and then we conclude this discussion. Um, thank you. I'll agree with Professor on the issue of um, self-financing. One of the key things that uh, I like the, what the keynote said is that as uh, NGOs, we, we, have, we have adopted the old agenda of the um, Millennium Development Goals. The, we have an amorphous organization like the UN operating in silos. But most importantly, they come and bring uh, ideas or their propagations to the people. It's like what Jeremiah said, we need to adopt to more participatory approaches, get to the grassroots. But this cannot be entirely done if our source of funding is 100% donor-oriented. If we approach uh, our financing to having mostly our own income generated, you'll find that we will be able to have more purpose-driven, more passion-driven interventions with our communities. And if it's participatory, it becomes more sustainable, more affordable, you get. You've seen the people power campaigns going to the grassroots, engaging the people, and they are contributing to the campaign. The same with most of the other political parties. But if we have a more conventional approach that we're using, you'll find that it will be more expensive. And NGOs have adapted because of the reliance on donor money. We come here, most of the people we invite, our negotiation is how much is transport refund. And I know most of the leaders here will agree. Most of our beneficiaries are asking how much is transport refund. But if we go to the grassroots, we have our own core funding as entrepreneurs, adopting to the social entrepreneurship model. Our constitution allows it, the NGO Bureau allows it for NGOs to generate money. As I, I've been witness to that, and I've seen it work, in that where you write a proposal and it's rejected, you have the resources to test your idea and get a proof of concept and be able to do meaningful impact on the grassroots level. But that takes us the zeal to be able to generate our own income and be able to do what we want to do. And also, most importantly, adapting to the digital transition that we are all going under. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's a comment at the back and here. Uh, thank you, Kanere. My name is Eddie Kainda. Uh, professor specifically, uh, thank you very much, Professor, for those insights. We do not see universities especially professors come, as, come out to guide the nation over such kind of issues. You mentioned very specific issues of getting a national agenda that haunts us to, uh, to be adaptive to the issues that affect the common person. We know that uh, universities do not only stop at teaching, researching, but also informing and educating the community. Do we see universities come out to, to inform the masses, to engage in research that helps us uh, raise civic awareness. In many other developed countries, when universities speak, the nation listens. We do not see universities do this in Uganda. And we 
kind of feel disappointed that the good professors are seated and not doing something about this. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Here at the front. Thank you very much um, on the panel so today. Frederick Msimenta is my name from the Uganda Dialogue Arena. We mainly interact with the students uh, in the universities and secondary schools on matters of national importance. Yes, today's uh, deliberation has been key, and I've, I must admit that I picked a point or two from Professor Chiza's submission. One of the key uh, issues that we must understand there cannot be political, cannot succeed politically unless we have economic independence. So even if you bring all the best policies, the, how to win an election, if your people are not empowered polit uh, economically, we shall be wasting time. One, if a person is not politically, uh, economically empowered, they will be easily bought off. They have talked of the very many political parties we have which would want to get power. Will they get it? No, because uh, some of them, if not most of them, you'll find that individuals are looking for food of today, Medea Lero. So you don't expect somebody who is searching for food not to be swayed. Whoever comes with the big, with big money is what he's the one will go with. In short, uh, the one who pays the piper, because they tune. So not until the NGOs and other civil societies go down on the grassroots and empower people. Let them be self-reliant. Even our NGOs, you know, we rely on donations. How many have business enterprises they are running? Apart from a few, I think I know Faraja, they have something. When a donor gives you money, you are not sure of tomorrow. No one expected COVID. So I'm very sure some of those NGOs who received funding and had already spent almost half of it or three quarters and COVID set in, the donors didn't have money. Some of them have closed or they even didn't have funds. So we have to uh, teach self-reliance, especially the young people. If you can engage young people, engage them to be involved in agriculture, those who can do engage in business, who cannot go do into agriculture, they can do business in town, they be involved in urban trade. But not until we have some economic empowerment, the issue of political uh, transitions will, be, will take longer than we expect. So the bottom line is, let us empower our communities. The, co the empowerment starts from your family, starts from the people you are, your classmates, you are, the people you, have, you work with. If your circles are not empowered, then how will you be empowered? They say that when you find nine millionaires and you sit with them, you automatically become the tenth. So you also mind about the circle of the people you have. They tell you that your network is your net worth. So the people you associate with are the people who are going to be, uh, you will actually reflect the behavior they have. So you have to choose your friends wisely. Then I think has to go back to the family, the fa how we are bringing our people. He was talking about how he was, uh, Sarah was talking about she was called them all. So it goes, people are very angry. We are angry at ourselves, angry at our uh, fellow people who are in the NGO world. We, there's a lot of mistrust. So not until we teach people to respect people's opinion. If somebody doesn't agree with you, just respect their opinion, but you don't castigate them, you don't uh, treat them as enemies, no. So we have to do a lot of soul uh, searching so that we are able to move our country forward. I submit. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Prof, would you like to give us uh, your closing remarks so we can wind yes, up this conversation? Yes, I want to say that I thank you, members of civil society, for keeping some of these spaces open. You can't have this conversation in, in Rwanda. Are we together? In Kigali, you can't talk like this. The regime there says shut up. And the difference is that they say shut up, but we are working. Here they say, Kabogere, Bajakoa. But they are Waka, Bebake. Does anybody know that language? Kamogere, mm. Mujakoa, Mudeo. But the point is that there is a space here for a conversation on our spaces as citizens, spaces as members of civil society. Th that space is something we should celebrate. So there is a space for you to write certain things in the press, and that one we should celebrate. And I also have mentioned, and I need to emphasize as I close, that your space is not space for the faint-hearted. Political work is not for the faint-hearted. When you engage in a competitive game and lose one election, you are not a failure. You have just learned what does not work under certain circumstances. 
John Howard was in Australia. I was in Australia as a student, graduate student. John Howard had lost elections three times. And he went in the fourth one when I was entering Australia. He lost. And then he said, look, I'm giving this just one last try. One last one. And then when he won, the office of prime minister elected. He actually worked longer than most other prime ministers. Because there you can renew your mandate as long as the people continue to vote you. So we also have a very interesting and hopefully motivating story from the innovator of the bulb, the fluorescent, fluorescent bulb. And, and he made so many tries searching for this bulb which works cost effectively. And hundreds of times he failed. And when he was asked about why his, he was not giving up, he said, and I think this is important for all of us, I have not failed. I have only learned 99 things, 99 ways that don't work. So when you go into this competitive game, whether you're organizing civil society, whether you're supporting those others in the competitive game, do not always think that you'll win the first time you try. Because politics is competitive. Remember, you need to invest in game theory. As you plan your political tactics and strategies, your opponents are also planning. So in other words, you need to find out through game theory how you can outsmart your rivals. One failure at tactical level should not result in your, 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 your moral, you know, surrender. You should not surrender because you have lost at tactical level. I think the issue is to keep the eyes on matters of, of strategy. Now my friend here is asking, Eddie Kayinja, university professors are not guiding the nation. First, that is an accusation. But second, you say, are you guiding the nation? I don't know what I should respond to. I, I want to submit that I hear your voice, but I also want you to appreciate that academics are not homogeneous. We are not homogeneous. Some academics have said, let fate decide. They resolve the matters of misgovernance by going to pray for the death of the misgovernors, the misrulers. That is one category. A certain categories have gone into politics to massage the ego of the ruling elites. So they join politics to endorse the agendas of the party in power. Others have left academia to join competitive politics in the opposition. But some have remained in the university to raise critical voices that concern all of us as citizens. Academics are not homogeneous. Some of the academia have been captured by the state. Some are endorsing and massaging the ego of the, the ruling elites. But there are also critical voices and critical spaces. So do we communicate to impact? Yes, the, the, the official channels of communicating academic wisdom is through publishing journal articles and publishing books. Now, now, do those get read by the average citizen? Not necessarily. Not even people in civil society pick interest in reading our academic stuff. Sometimes we hide certain things in jargon. But the point is that when we write as academics, we publish in professional channels, which are good for our professional growth and our promotion. But when we work with the civil society, then we produce less academic, more accessible knowledge in the form of policy reports, policy briefs, newspaper articles. So some of us are doing a little bit of both. Can we do better? Of course, yes. Frederick is saying, uh, yes, I think Frederick is preaching to the converted, upholding my view that you cannot succeed politically unless your people are empowered economically. Because that for me is a fundamental issue. Is there a way we can repackage our programs, our strategies, our plans, our finances to ensure that whatever we do, we speak to the needs of the community we claim to be serving? What is the essence of telling a poor household in Kisoro or a poor household in Karamoja or in Busoga where children have become skyscrawls chasing away birds from rice fields 
What is the essence of preaching them that children must have an education? When you have not resolved their problem of how to earn an income, wouldn't it make sense for us to demonstrate how you can actually grow rice without necessarily denying children the right to an education? So we need to address and connect the access to service with an income of the household. Perhaps a household whose income has risen will hire labor of an adult and allow the children to go to school. So my friends, I really think we have to be creative with the resources we have. We have the opportunity to be able to invest in something that speaks to the economic interests of the people we serve. Once people are economically empowered, they will be less vulnerable to capture. They will be less vulnerable to this, you know, a yoga ideology. The idea of give them crumbs falling off the high table of the national political economy. We are giving them crumbs to keep them stuck in the Garden of Aden. We are not investing in fundamental investments that will transition them from rural-based, poverty-stricken people into factory workers, into members of the digital economy, into members who are more fruitful to the nation. But how come civil society is not speaking to that and creating an alternative experiment which works so that we can have proof of concept? So I think there's a lot of work to be done, and I want to emphasize that when you get frustrated at one stage, don't give up, because your game of civil society is not for the faint-hearted. You have to shift your horizon from the short run to the long term. And in the process, please build alliances with people within your civil society, with people across the civil society ecosystem, but also with people in government. Not all of them are your enemies. I want to submit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Julius Chiza. And uh, for me, my biggest takeaway was how you really guided us on focusing on structural reforms other than the cosmetic ones, which are really most likely going to succeed. Very many thanks to ACFIM for putting this conversation together. And uh, I hope all of you have really gotten a thing or two. I'd like to invite Eddie Kainda, Senior Program Officer, ACFIM, to guide us on the next stage. But for now, many thanks to all of you who have been part of this conversation, both physically here and online. So we revolutionary don't retire. Do I stay here? Can I retire? Yeah, please oh, retire, please. sir. Could somebody come and take over? Uh, thank you, Canary, for, for that. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Alliance for Finance Monitoring, my name is Eddie Kainda. We want to thank uh, Canary for taking us through this, uh, but most importantly, the professor, my good professor, for giving us guidance on the issues that we discussed, uh, including Sarah. Uh, Alliance for Finance Monitoring is glad to have joined ourselves to discussing this important conversation and uh, we can bear witness to you that we shall continue engaging the civil society and other partners in uh, uh, directing the course of democracy in Uganda but most importantly we shall not tire to raise our voices to ensuring that uh, we can bring democracy to order we can bring politics to order and most importantly, to ensure that we can have democracy that benefits the people, just like the discussion has been. Uh, we look forward to more engagement with you, and uh, we thank you very much for participation and saving this important time for us to engage into this. Our partners, PPI, thank you so much. Uh, we should be having some administrative announcements, I, ge I guess, from uh, Chirabo and party that uh, organized this. I, I would want to, on behalf of Alliance for Finance Monitoring, officially close this and wish you the very best of the deliberations. After this, we shall be having lunch and we shall disperse. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you, Eddie. I'd love to invite all of us for lunch. We'll be served down at Palm Garden, take the staircases, and you'll find the restaurant. Thank you. <laughs>